morning, everyone, and welcome to the Mesa City Council study session for April the 5th. All of our council is present. Uh, the first item on our agenda for today's meeting is to hear a presentation, and, excuse me, and provide direction on the five-year capital improvement program focusing on utilities. Don't have soda pop for breakfast or that will happen to you on television. Uh, we invite uh, Beth Huning and Scott Butler to come forward for this first agenda item. Beth and Scott, welcome. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to review the proposed five-year CIP with you. Uh, today we'll be focusing on the utility side um, of the CIP. <clears throat> That'll include projects that, um, in our water resources and energy resources departments. And then we'll be back on uh, April 26th to highlight the general government side of the CIP, including parks, transportation, as well as public safety. <clears throat> As far as what we'll be uh, discussing today, um, I'm gonna provide an overview of how the capital improvement program is developed. We'll discuss uh, CIP funding for utility projects. Um, we also have some slides uh, regarding the 2014 uh, utility bond projects. And then Beth will highlight the status of some of our significant projects on the utility side. As far as the development of the capital improvement program, it's a multi-year plan for um, the city's uh, infrastructure. Um, there's a lot of steps that go into developing the plan, everything from project concepts through scoping, design, and construction. So it, it encompasses several years in order to see a project completed. Projects are identified through several means, including staff analysis, particularly with utilities, um, where they focus on demand and also system reliability to make sure that the infrastructure can continue to deliver service. There's also contractual obligations uh, that we meet for services that we share with other uh, regional partners. And then also council direction through strategic initi initiatives and other means. The city council approves the first year of the funding um, of the CIP during the annual budget process. And then during the fiscal year, um, as projects move through the, the process of design and construction, those contracts are brought back for your consideration and approval. <clears throat> as far as the project types that are in the CIP, we, we classify them as two primary means, either they're funded or they're planned. Funded means that they have a, a, an identified funding source set aside for them. Um, if they're planned, it means that there is a need to complete them and but yet uh, the funding is still uh, being discussed. The example I would give is um, our 91st Avenue wastewater treatment facility that we share with partners uh, in Phoenix. It's managed by Phoenix. Um, and we have um, contractual requirements for the capital improvements that are completed at that facility. Some of those are funded today as part of the 2014 bond authorization. Um, and some of them uh, are requirements that are in future years that will we will need to fund through, um, through a source um, that's not identified at this time. Specifically for our, our utility areas, um, the two primary means that we fund projects, local revenues, that means cash. There are some, some projects that it makes more sense for us, it's more cost effective for us to use uh, cash to pay for those things as opposed to long-term long financing. Um, our other means to finance projects is uh, to use utility revenue bonds. Uh, and then the debt service uh, is paid on those bonds um, through city utility operations. <clears throat> Another component of uh, the CIP involves the ongoing operations and maintenance in order to maintain these projects. On the utility side, there isn't a great deal of operations and maintenance. However, um, we currently have two plants that are under construction, the Signal Butte Water Treatment Plant, as well as the expansion at the Greenfield um, Wastewater Reclamation Plant. Both of those plants um, require significant operations and maintenance. And in particular, from a planning perspective for the Signal Butte plant, um, <clears throat> that plant will come online um, in a couple of months. And the staff, in order to, to operate that plant, they actually were brought on over the last couple of fiscal years to make sure that their training is up to date so that when the plant comes online, it's a seamless transition. <clears throat> So good morning, Mayor and Council. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the status of our bond projects and uh, how the work is going and where we are with the funding. Um, in 2014, we were blessed with uh, a, a 
positive bond election for our utilities departments for water resources and energy resources in water, wastewater, natural gas, and electric. Um, this table just, it's a lot of numbers, but these were the four categories for the projects that we went out to the public with. Uh, we got 315.7 million in water, 178.2 in wastewater, 59 in natural gas, and 27 in electric in that bond election. The projects in water were distributed like this table shows you and broken down. You'll see the largest category of the funding is in customer demand in Southeast Mesa. And that's primarily because of several major projects that we needed to do in this cycle, one of which is the Signal Butte uh, water plant located at Signal Butte and Elliott, which we hope to turn the tap on next month to provide water to the southeast portion of the city. And then the pipelines that go to feed it and take water away from it on Elliott Road out to, and one out to the raw water canal. In addition, we had uh, two large pipelines that needed to be built in West Mesa to take water from our existing Val Vista water plant down into the zones in West Mesa. Those projects will all be wrapping up here this summer and will be complete. And they represent over 60% of the water bond program as it was envisioned and voted on in 2014. These are just the projects and the pictures of the projects. You can see the new Signal Butte water plant down in the corner. This is from last month. Well, the water projects are distributed all over the valley. The remainder of the 40% of the projects are pretty much uh, distributed all over the city in different parts of the city under various uh, statuses of construction. The wastewater program, the 178.2 million, you can see the um, obligations in the categories we have there in the life cycle re replacement, the contractual obligations that Scott talked about, customer demand. Again, if you look at the way the numbers distributed for the projects, the largest portion uh, of the wastewater bonds was for customer demand in Southeast Mesa. And that is because of one major wa uh, plant. It's a, it's a joint project. We operate, own and operate this plant in conjunction with the town of Queen Creek and the town of Gilbert as our partners. We are in the process of expanding the plant now and just started the next construction project. It represents 125 million of the bond program as it was envisioned in 2014, which is about 70% of the total bonds that we had available. We hope to uh, op uh, open that next expansion in the fall of 2020. These large projects take time. They're not something we can do off the shelf and they take a period of years to develop and build. And they have to be in place before the demand exists. So you, could, you might be able to build a house and not complete the road in front of it, but you can't build a house and not have water and sewer service. So th these major facilities are built in advance of the need. These are some of the other wastewater projects we have going. Uh, we have some at the Southeast uh, Wastewater Reclamation Facility that you can see up there in the Northwest Water Reclamation Facility. Those facilities are aging. Um, like me, they're getting to a point where some of the infrastructure needs, <laughs> needs some help. So um, we are working very hard to do replacement projects at those treatment plants. And uh, um, as well as pipelines throughout the city, we have a numerous pipelines in our systems, particularly in the the mid to western portions of the city that are aging and reaching 50 years plus in our systems. Our electric, Mesa is unique in many ways and one of them is in our infrastructure and one of them is that we have an electric and gas utility, which uh, the other cities in the valley do not have. Um, so it makes us a little bit different than the other cities. So you see that we carry a bond debt for those utilities as well. The electric system is, uh, was in the program for about $27 million. Um, and now I'm gonna kind of put this map in perspective because when I first showed this, the city manager goes, wow, look how big the service area is. It's really only five and a half square miles, but we blew it up here a little bit. <laughs> yeah, he did, you should have seen him. It was, wow, not really. Um, <laughs> But um, it's five and a half square miles of basically the core of the downtown area of Mesa. You can see the projects we have going on in the electric service area in this map. Natural gas is again very different in what we do. We um, had $59 million in it. We can see much of it is for customer demand and new growth in new areas of the city. And that's for two reasons. When you look at the service areas, 
of our natural gas system, we have the Mesa area in natural gas. This map, if you put it in perspective, is 90 square miles compared to the prior map that was five and a half square miles. And this represents over 42,000 customers in the city of Mesa. But it's not all of our natural gas system. This map looks quite small, but this is 236 square miles of service area. So roughly two and a half times what we have in Mesa today. It's the magma service area in the southeast part of the valley. Um, conversely, this uh, service area right now has only about 19,000 customers, but is growing. And we have a lot of demand for new services in this area. So natural gas and electric are not, they're not projects that drive other projects. Streets projects, water and sewer drive other projects. If we're in doing a street or redoing a street, um, we generally replace the utilities at that time. We do joint trench uh, water and natural gas in the same trench. So if we're replacing water, we're typically replacing natural gas. And then electric, a lot of their program is for new customers and customer demands. And that's true of the natural gas system as well. And with that, we will continue in the future to have needs in these same categories, same areas. Utilities are ongoing. They're, they go to infinity. They, um, we are looking right now at the projects we have completing with the bond program we have in about 2020. So that's what the future looks like for the utilities. Uh, we'll continue to need to do life cycle replacement. We'll continue to meet new demands. Mesa is, uh, I once heard somebody say it's a tale of two cities where you have a portion of the city that's more mature and it's aging and we have an all new portion of the city is developing very rapidly as you know. So those demands will continue to be part of the needs for these systems as we go forward. Mayor and Council, just, just to um, highlight, uh, this is the proposed CIP for utilities. It'll be back on May 21st uh, for your consideration for adoption. Uh, also included in your packets was a, a project summary list that contains all of the proposed utility projects for your review. At this time, if you have any questions for us. Thank you. Mr. Thompson. I know, uh, everybody always hates when they start doing the natural gas side. <laughs> I, <laughs> I may need to call Frank up for backup. <laughs> well, my own, one of my questions on the natural gas side is, is the joint with water. I always get nervous when we're when we have pressure with pressure, and then especially if you have a water line failure, because um, it'll erode the dirt and collapse the pavement or the dirt above, which will end up falling in on your gas line. Are we having, have we had issues where we've had ground settlement due to a water line break? Because uh, I know we've had some water line breaks over the last year. Have we had any issues with joint trench where they've collapsed on our gas lines? Uh, Mayor, Council Member Thompson, not that I'm aware of. I'm gonna ask Jake. Are you aware of any, Jake? I'm not aware of any that we've had. We, we are pretty proactive in trying to replace those old mains. And I know, as you know, our gas system is subject to many regulatory requirements as well. Oh, Jake. Mayor, Council Member Thompson, we do from time to time have a water main break, 90% of where our water lines are in the older parts of Mesa and some of the newer stuff. Um, we do have an occasion where um, we may impact the gas lines, but we work well with the energy department in conjunction with that. Uh, when that does happen, the first priority is to isolate the gas main and then we'll get in and do our work afterwards. Typically, the way it is set up in our trench detail is the gas is either a foot above or a foot off to the side. Um, and our locators doing a very effective job of letting us know where it's at. And 90% of our, we've got a lot of younger kids nowadays coming up, but some of the old timers that are still around. We're familiar with the systems and where they're at. And so we do take precaution when this does happen. Okay. That was my only question on that. And then um, on this septic to sewer, um, did we utilize um, very many of the funds? I know that we had, like a couple of years ago, we had funds set aside for the septic to sewer. Did we see a large use of those funds uh, for replacements? Councilman Thompson, Mayor, yes, we have. We had um, some dollars set aside for some some projects. We did a project over there off of Southern Avenue, which is um, Lynn Ray Square, where we went out and put a significant amount of dollars into that system and got them off of the septic sewer and into the city system. We had another project that came to us from some residents out there on Palm Lane in Val Vista. I think it was about seven or eight homes that they'd 
they built these houses years ago, and so their septic system systems were failing. So we met with them with best best staff, went out and put a project together. It was a little <coughs> smaller project, but that went very well. We've got about nine people that went off of septic uh, prior to, to their failure and are now connected to the city system. Do we do we still have funds available We've for that? We've got some funds available, so when we use them wherever we can. We do have some projects that are coming up. Um, Right now, we're out in the East Mesa area where we're doing water and gas line replacements. We're also doing a sewer in that area too, and we're using some of those funds. Awesome, okay. Are we gonna do another marketing campaign or anything to advertise the septic to sewer? I believe as the funds become available, we'll start the campaigns, yeah. We're kind of running, getting to the end of it. Though. Exactly. We don't really wanna promote it if we don't have the funding right now. Okay. So if we came back on another uh, bond election, that exactly. would be something we would do. Okay, perfect, thank you. Mr. Freeman. Thank you, Beth. Um, I didn't hear mention about the downtown cooling system. How's that infrastructure? Is it maxed out? I mean, is there any, what's the plan with that? Well, my memory is we have room for another chiller in the system. Um, it's not maxed out, uh, but I know that, I guess we'd have to get facilities up to, to talk a little bit about the, the current status of the system. Yeah, uh, Mayor Council, we've looked at that. Um, the cost to even add to and extend the system, um, we've gone through the numbers. There's not um, an economic reason right now probably to extend it beyond what we have in our city um, buildings. Um, and so we need to, we're still studying that, but right now the uh, cost expense to um, expand the capacity is um, economically not penciling out for us at this point. So, but it's something we can look at. Um, so that's that's kind of our challenge right now. So, thank you. Other questions, Mr. Whitaker. On slide five, you guys talk about um, planned projects and a need to complete within a five-year period. Uh, within the utilities, is there like years that you're tracking the uh, end of life for certain items that are going to need large amounts of capital, and what percentage of those are actually? funded versus unfunded or like are you planning for the long term um, like expiration of some of these uh, things that are going to need a significant amount of money beyond the five year period? Yeah, yes, um, Council Member Whitaker, our utilities department has an asset management program, a very robust asset management plan, and they, they uh, monitor and watch the years and the dates on um, everything, including the pumps at the treatment plant to the pipes in the ground. Um, and there are years that they're looking at that. I know water actually has a graph that shows you, based on the, their pipes, the particular ages of their pipes, how many of them fall in like the 30 to 40 years, 40 to 50, 50 to 6, and they moni monitor those. And, and then they also look at leak rate, where they get the most leaks, and they combine those two to establish where their next projects are for replacement of those pipes. You'll see us out, uh, right now we're doing some quarter section replacement, what we call quarter section replacement projects right now for water and gas. Um, there's three of them under construction right now. I can give you the locations if you want them, but every year we do a certain number of those that replace those facilities as they age out. Yeah, I'm just more concerned uh, over, like let's say the next 30 years. Uh, is there a chart that you guys could provide me with at some point in the future that show uh, the amount of capital cost that's required over each year and the percentage of that is, that is currently funded or if we're allocating funds from the budget to actually fund some of those items or what is the plan when those items come and have to be replaced? So Mayor, Council, we um, we don't, we only have funded what you see in yeah. the five-year CIP and what's funded by bonds. So there's nothing, there's no funding or budget. We have a, you know, five-year forecast well, the only thing we'll have after that, there's nothing funded of a project that needs to be completed in 10 years, 20 years from now. We don't, that's why the, um, typically we don't go out for bonds about, we do it about every five years or so. So the next opportunity for us to identify funding, we come in 2022, 2020. 2020. And so we will identify the needs, which we can provide to you, which is the same, what Beth just talked about. We have the identified infrastructure, its age and the anticipated replacement, 
but there's no funding other, well, the funding that would be identified would come through bonds. And so what you do is identify that long-term kind of life cycle um, of the infrastructure so we can kind of see what's ahead of us. But then we don't, we come each, every five years to council to, for the actual funding source for that. So the funding is only identified in a five-year window, just like we did in 2014. Mm -hmm. That's where you had, you know, it was one of the largest ones we did, almost $600 million. It, of course, it had two major, two major plants. plants in it. Um, typically, we're replacing pipe. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so that's what you'll see in 2020. We'll come to council with the next five-year CIP. We'll show you what we think our needs are. I guess we can go out as far as you want with our asset yes, management and showing, because we've got pipe that's 30, 50 years old, so we know that that's the areas where we focus on our replacement program first. But we don't have something that's 10 years out. The assumption is at some point in the future, there will be a future bond package that will fund that. But we only come to council or come to the public about every five, mm -hmm. this time six years. We're stretching out to six years for this next round. I guess I just don't want to get caught with any huge surprises outside of just a short window of five years. Like if there's a massive, you know, so, uh, $600 million project that needs to be done. Yeah, typically it would be the, well, that's what, so that's what happened in 2014. We had talked to council that it had been, I think prior to that, Greenfield was 2015, 20, or not, uh, 20, 2006, 2005. 2006 and 2010. 16. Yeah. So um, that's, we can identify those expansion needs in the plants because those are the big chunks. And, um, and then we can lay out kind of what we think our needs are for replacing the piping across the city. The other big challenge we have that you see in the pressure in the enterprise fund um, are these big plants. I mean, if we went out and got the 500, almost $600 million. Um, that has to get paid for. And so to accommodate not only replacing the old infrastructure, but keeping up with the new demand, we're kind of facing both of those right now. We're facing the aging of infrastructure and the older part of the community mm -hmm. that we are trying to keep up with. But at the same time, we're running as fast as we can to keep up with um, the new demand um, in parts of our city, not only on the residential side, but on the industrial side. And so, um, but that it affects the rates. We've lost, we've lost the ability. Um, we used to have um, a, a, a more efficient way to get impact fees from new development that would help offset a lot of that cost, that would offset the debt directly. Um, that's been eliminated pretty much to the effect or taken away from us. So today, m m much of that cost is related to the new infrastructure that we see, and we will, we anticipate we're going to have to expand Signal Butte again. We'll yes. have to expand Greenfield again sometime in the future. So we see, and we can kind of tell you what that looks like. <laughs> but unfortunately, because of the way the legislature has removed that from us, all those costs now have to be applied across the entire city. Um, it used to be that we were able to capture a portion of that from new development, but we no longer can do that. And what about in Southeast Mesa, how we have uh, the special taxing district? I can't think yeah, of the name CFDs. of it. Yeah, the, what is CFDs. Community, yeah, facil the CFDs. C community is that facility district. Something that we've considered, is that just like, an, that's not a well, way to Well, that's not for us, that's for the developer. The developer um, is, receives those funds uh -huh. to pay off the infrastructure that they've put in, and that's typically the streets. The streets, water, um, sewer some of the sewer water, but any other development typically would pay for that. They would just um, embed that in the cost of the land. There, this methodology, it becomes a special tax uh, assessment, is that a better word? Assessment. I'm not sure. assessment, assessment on the properties, um, which is much, much significant, more sig it's three times as much as what um, the city has across the whole city. Okay, yeah, I guess just in summary, if you guys could provide me with uh, as far as a vision as you have, if you could provide me with a chart of the uh, life cycle and the capital costs that are anticipated over those years, I would appreciate that. And Councilmember Whitaker, uh, maybe just to highlight a specific example with the Signal Butte plant. The first time that we documented the, the, the need for a plant on the east side of Mesa was back in 2001. Um, and then of course over time, um, as we, as the Water Resources Department and Engineering looked at demand um, and service requirements out there and reliability, 
than 2014. Um, the cost effectiveness to build the plant was right, and so now we have the plant coming on to service in a couple of months. So your, your CIP today is how far, how far do you So the, C, the CIP that OMB coordinates, we, we monitor 10 years, um, and then per, char, per charter requirement is when we bring five years for, for council consideration, but we look at 10 years. You can imagine that after the first few years, it, it can get a little, um, if the words foggies um, as far as uh, what specific things will be done over time, um, but the utility areas both look at their their <coughs> pipe their pipes mm -hmm. they you know whether it's cameras in the pipes to make sure that they're reliable and things like that to make sure that when the projects come when the timing is right that the project needs to be completed. And, and I will also point out that both water and wastewater have um, utility master plans that take them through build out looking at projections of demand through build out as well. So they have maps that show where we need to build major pipelines, major transmission mains and, and treatment facilities. Yeah, I trust that you guys have that all planned out. I'm more just concerned just on the financial chart. side, what that unfunded piece looks like so that we can anticipate for those costs. Councilor Roberta Carl, a lot of those projects are, are in that uh, project summary, um, it's, it's at least um, for the five year period. If any phase of them starts within the five-year period. So you'll see that the that a proposed 2020 utility bond, what that what those projects would look like are included in that summary. But we can certainly provide that Great. additional Thank information you. for you. <clears throat> Just to continue that uh, line for a minute, I think some of the utility bond authorizations we got in 2014 can be used for uh, additional expansion of the facilities that are being constructed right now. Is that correct, or do we need to go back to the voters to expand those facilities? So, Mayor, the 2014 included um, the expansion of the Greenfield water, Wastewater Treatment Plant, which is, which is happening. It included the construction of the Signal Butte Water Treatment Plant, which will be opening in May. 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 <laughs> May. End of May. Okay. May. <laughs> okay. Um, Maybe the last so, day. those were included May. in that, as well as other pipe. Beyond that, uh, any additional expansion, uh, and we have the capacity to expand Signal Butte in Greenfield also at yes, some point? Yes, um, actually, we're, by the time we're done with this expansion, we're just over 50% of the site build out. So we, project. at some point, and part of the analysis that we have to sit down and do every year is determine um, when that next um, addition will take place. But it was the, we only, in the 500, the 2014 just included the current phases of what's being completed at Signal Butte and Greenfield today. Any additional expansions of either one of those plants would be a subsequent bond election. election. Okay, that answers my question, but I think I've heard that the, the industrial development in Southeast Mesa is moving at such a rapid pace mm -hmm. that we might, there's already some discussion of, hey, we're, yeah, we're bringing on a lot more capacity, but there's demand for even additional capacity. So I guess I was hoping that there was some bonding uh, that was already authorized for some of that additional expansion, but it's what you're telling me is there's not. Okay. And I think uh, water is projecting moving the, putting the signal butte design starting in 2021 for the next expansion. Okay. Thank you. Council, additional questions? Thank you very much, great presentation. The next item on our agenda for this meeting is to hear a presentation and provide direction on department budgets and utility rate recommendations for water resources, environmental management, energy resources, and the Economic Investment Fund. <coughs> Welcome uh, Candace and her crew again. Are we starting with, uh, Morning, we're starting Mayor with water, Council. I think, aren't we? Yep, Brian Ritchell with the uh, uh, Office of Management and Budget. There we go. And kind of give you an, I'm here, I'll kind of give you an overview in the way where we kind of set this up since it's three departments in one presentation. I'll give the kind of the, the beginning intro and then we'll have each individual department come up and give their uh, presentation of their budget. And then at the end, uh, then Candace will come up and we'll give the, uh, the overview financial of the enterprise fund. So bear with us while we play musical chairs here. So with the, as I mentioned, the enterprise operations, the city looks at it as a whole, as one fund, um, but each 
department, each utility is operated as a separate business center. Um, when we look at the enterprise fund, we look at the, uh, the overall fund and the reserve balance, the ending reserve balance we, uh, with, for financial policy of the city. It uh, needs to be uh, no less than eight to 10% throughout the forecast period, and the forecast period is usually around five years. Uh, with that, to keep that, the uh, reserve balance, we smooth the rate adjustments year to year, so there's no, uh, we try not to do any rate spikes, either down or up. And then with the reserve balance, uh, we use to phase in, it helps to phase in new programs uh, or in change in operations that we have. So with that, we will, uh, I'll hand it over to Jake for uh, the Water Resources Department. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm Jake West, Water Resources Department Director with, I, I have with me today, Deputy Director Seth Weld. Um, we're here to discuss the Water Resources Department um, and about our accomplishments and the things that we're doing in water resources. So the City of Mesa has provided safe, reliable, and economical and environmentally responsible water services to the citizens of Mesa for over a century. We have, currently have about 149,000 um, water connections. We do use the term connections because a connection is actually a meter point that may be a, an apartment complex where there are more citizens, excuse me, and 125,000 wastewater connections in our systems. Some of our accomplishments this past year is that um, we started a, um, <coughs> excuse me, we started a, a marketing campaign for our, our water ourselves. Um, we got away, we call it our get to know your HTO, H2O and we have a water bar. We set this system up, at, it's gonna be there at Celebrate Mesa, we have it at Celebrate Freedom. We've actually had a couple departments reach out to us when they're having um, some conferences or whatever where we bring in jugs of Mesa water that is then cooled and then we serve that to our, cu to our customers and our residents rather than the use of um, encouraging, discouraging the use of bottled water where we can treat the water and we're actually really just marketing the value of, the, of City of Mesa's water. And that's been, that was, um, I received a copper, and, a copper award for, for merit um, for the water bar. We also got another award from the Public Relations Society of America with regards to our consumer confidence report. That report used to just kind of be just a little folder that would talk about it, all the things that we do in water, how we treat it, um, and all the things that go into producing high quality water. What we've done now is we've kind of fluffed it up a little bit and we've got, we can actually do it now. We can deliver it not only to our residents by address, we have it online for anybody. And anytime anybody calls or has a question, whether it's the media or just a resident about the quality of our water, um, we can provide that document to them. Um, we also have, uh, we're very proud of our um, lab supervisor, Matt Rexing. He's been with the city for 30 plus years and he received a national honor um, a merit award from the AWWA. Um, and what we've started doing recently with um, our business um, development coordinator and department PIO, Kathy McDonald, she's been working with Mesa Public Schools and we sent out a bunch of student workbooks to, to talk to, teach kids about the value of water and what goes into doing water. And these are targeted uh, to um, K through three and four through six. And I wanna point out that the materials that uh, we provide them with align with STEM curriculum at Mesa Public Schools. Some of the challenges that we are having in water resources is really no different um, um, with Mesa or any of, is the, is the hiring and recruiting and retaining qualified employees. Um, currently with the expansion of the Greenfield plant and the new Signal Butte water treatment plant, we are competing with valley-wide cities for the same talent. We need to have talented operators and supervisors come out and operate and maintain these um, um, systems. So we're, we're struggling with that a little bit that because our neighbor to the south of us, Gilbert and um, Chandler are both, um, they're expanding their Santan plant. I think it's just gone online last month. So they were in a major project. So it's the same technology, the same type of plant that we're building out of Signal Butte and they need to staff that. They have the same needs of staffing that plant as we do. So we're kind of like, we're all in the same ring. We're in the, we're in the octagon, you know, fighting for the same talent, so. Um, some another challenge is the water commodity. Our, our water costs are going up. It's not just the cost of the water, but it's the infrastructure that gets it there. 
And so um, those costs are increasing and we are looking at a possible, there are not any discussions right now that there, we don't think there's gonna be a shortage, but we do recognize that it's been a dry winter and hopefully we'll have another miracle May, but uh, we're constantly watching you know, the value and, and the, the status of the water on the river, both the Salt River and the uh, Birdie River watersheds, as well as the Colorado River. And then, as was mentioned earlier with the conversation with, um, with Beth Huning, is that um, we're trying to find that balance of you know, managing that and maintaining that aging infrastructure along with the new infrastructure going in. So that provides, you know, it's a challenge to us. We make sure that we've got a, a steady balance there. We, we, do, we haven't increased a lot of staff in most recent years, so you'll see in a future slide that we're, we're addressing some of those concerns with bringing on some additional staff. I'm sorry, Jake, can yeah. I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Uh, how, I mean, we, we, we pay for the water, whether it comes from SRP or CAP, so how does having a wet May, how would that help us? Does that lower the, the cost, the commodity cost of water if there's an abundance of water in the SRP reservoirs? Do we pay less or how does having a wet May help us? Well, it's not necessarily, the, it, it helps us because it gives us, it gives us more abundant source, but the cost of the water, uh, we actually see an annual increase on average from SRP about 5% uh, a year. And so we haven't seen, they haven't set their rates yet this year, so we haven't seen that cost. But our capital cost with regards to the Colorado River system, we pay for the water that per acre foot, and, and, and there's a future slide in this presentation to discuss that too. It's also the cost of the water that we pay for, as well as the capital component for all the infrastructure that gets that water there. So Jake, a wet May just means that we wouldn't have to have water restrictions sometime in the future, yes. is that correct? So that's what it's saying. But there. it wouldn't necessarily reduce the commodity no, cost. The commodity no, the commodity cost is, okay. is, remember, utilities, most of our costs are fixed cost. They're not variable cost. They're not um, a commodity as much as they are very much a fixed cost. And so that's why rates, are dictated mostly by recovering the cost of the large assets, the fixed cost. So most of our costs are really just the cost of the water and the transport of the water down the canal. It's the infrastructure to get that water uh, to the house, treat it and get it to the house. Yeah, it's similar to how we operate and maintain the, our water systems here. Regardless of the number of connections that we may have, we have to build that system based on max day demand and fire flows and all that other stuff. So we could see a year where we start, you know, our consumption is down and water accounts are down or whatever, but we still need to maintain those, those utility systems. So it's the same thing with uh, the cost per acre foot is, has two components. It's got the cost of the water and the capital component for maintaining that infrastructure. Our business objective is to provide uh, clean water on a daily basis with min minimal service disruptions to our customers. Um, we've got some, some measuring success with our meter readers read not only just water meters, they read gas, water, and electric meters uh, on every about 10,000 meters a month with um, an error rate factor of no less than, no more than three errors per 10,000 reads. And the value of that is, is that means that we're able to um, um, <clears throat> ensure that our customers receive accurate billing in a timely manner, which is fair and reasonable. Um, groundwater pumping, this is a metric that we typically um, don't see a lot of fluctuation in because we try to manage our water, you know, we try to use our well water and our groundwater as a backup resource. It's a kind of like our bank account. But you can see based on this slide here that it has been increasing. A lot of that has to do with on the Salt River side, which is the water that gets provided to basically the Mesa City Zone, which is the largest zone we have, which is Mesa proper, and the boundary line is the, is the canal the Eastern, Eastern Canal. Um, Salt River had, um, Salt River had a, a, an extended outage this year to do some canal maintenance. So the Val Vista water treatment plant was down and out, um, out of service temporarily. So what that required us to do was to operate more wells within the city zone as wet, and the same as um, while we're anticipating in May, we will have the Signal Butte water treatment plant we have been able to maintain water service in Southeast Mesa through not only just bringing Brown Road, we, right now we don't bring Brown Road water down to the south as far as we can go, 
but that doesn't meet the demand currently in Southeast Mesa, so we have to pump a lot of water out of the ground. So that's why that metric is, is climbing. We expect that to go back to normal once Signal Butte comes on. Um, another um, thing that I'd like to talk, bring out is like, when we talk about being able to serve our customers without disruption, we do have any, we recognize we have an aging system and we do have water main breaks and leaks throughout the day, throughout the days, weeks and months. But we think, I think we do an effective job of responding to those um, incidents when they occur. Most recently, we had a, a neighborhood that was almost flooded over in Emerson. We got out there, we got crews out there, we had the assistance of fire, and Mary Cabela's staff did a great job helping us. But I think we do an effective job of recognizing when those events happen, taking care of them, get the customers back in water, and, and then clean up the mess afterwards. Um, Account growth, everybody likes to talk about Southeast Mesa, but if you look at this slide, you can see that we're, we're experiencing growth all over the valley. Um, some significant ones, is you've, we've got uh, Lehigh Crossings up to the northeast, and then you've got um, um, Mountain Bridge, Mulberry, and Eastmark. Those are all areas where we're seeing a lot of growth, as well as in the, um, in the um, industrial corridor. We are, we are bringing on some large water users, and um, so, we are seeing a lot of account growth up there. So. This slide is kind of gives an overview of the system. You can see that throughout the years of how the system has grown. Currently, we have about 20, almost 2,400 miles of water mains in, service in, in the ground um, with additional pipes coming in, about another 80 addition miles coming in future development. And with those pipes comes appurtenances. That means we have to have, bring on uh, new pump stations, uh, lift stations, um, water reservoirs and, and well sites, so as well as fire hydrants. So that's all maintenance things that have to keep on coming as, as, the, as the system expands. Some significant budget challenges or changes from 1819 is our water commodity, as we were discussing earlier, we're expecting a $1.2 million increase in our water commodities between SRP and a, um, the Colorado River this year, and chemicals. Our chemical costs, our chemical costs are anticipated to grow, go, go up this year, but it's not with the cost of the chemicals, it's the usage. Um, because the surface water that we get, you can't always guarantee you know, consistent water quality, so there are times when we have to treat, use more money, use more chemicals to treat the water to get it into the system and be able to deliver it. the quality of the runoff that we get exactly. out right. of the system. Right. It's the watershed, and so we do participate with the National Forest Foundation to, cheat, you know, to, to provide resources so that we could um, thin the forest to do that. But yes, when we have a, a, a forest fire up in the, what, with the Verde or the salt watershed, all that stuff, and then you get some rains after that, like you see in California with the mudslides. When all that debris comes in with the water as it comes down into the valley, it then needs to be treated. And so that is an additional cost. So for years, some of the significant savings that the department has been realized is a lot of it was our chemical costs and our electrical costs because we do a very good job of making sure that when we're running our pumps or, or moving or pushing water, we're doing it off peak hours so that we're, we're saving money there. But we anticipate this year that our chemical costs are gonna go up because the quality of the water that we're currently getting. So not only are we paying more for the water, the quality of the water that we're getting is not that great. Uh, signal beat water treatment plant. Um, it will be coming on in May of 2018, so it'll be operating. Excuse me, Jake. Mr. So, uh, Luna has a question. Jake, I had a question on the meter reader positions. Mm -hmm. Do you anticipate that one day we'll have technology that will do that for us, so that we don't have to hire personnel to go and do that labor? That labor. Mayor, yeah. Vice Mayor Luna. Yes, we are currently with our our partners in energy. We do have an ongoing um, consultant that we got. We had went out for an RFP earlier this year. And we're talking with them. We're looking at, because of the challenges, much like Beth was alluding to, Mesa's different. It's not just water meters. We've got water, gas, and electric. So we are working with a firm called Utility Works and to look at what are the best options for all three of those utilities. The anticipation is yes. Even though we're bringing out, we're, you'll see in the future slide where we're at, we're at requesting and we're at, for another meter reader, 
it's gonna be a little while and it's gonna be a costly endeavor to, to get into that AMI system. That's where we're heading. We wanna get there, not only for just the meter reading purposes, it's for the customer. It's the value of it is actually the customer so that when a customer calls and has a concern about why their water bill went up, we'll be able to respond to that timely and effectively right then and there rather than have to go look for the information and find out what happened. But um, as we keep moving forward, we're, at, we're averaging about 200 water accounts per month so that's just water. That doesn't include um, gas and electric. You, that's another 100, so about 300 accounts per month that those meter readers have to read. So we have to bring one on. About every, every 10,000 meters that comes on into the, into the system, we have to bring on a new meter reader. Well, that new meter reader is not gonna be able to go out and read 600 meters in a day on that first day. So we have to bring them on a little bit earlier so we can get them trained and get them up to speed, <coughs> get them the equipment, but yes. To short answer to your question is we are looking at it and we're anticipating in a few years that we'll be there. Once again, Signal Buttes is coming online. Excuse, excuse in me, May. Jake. Oh. I'm sorry. Just to follow up, Thompson. So as we um, eventually transition more to the SCADA or the or the um, remote sensing on the meters, we we're still going to have someone that's physically going around looking at the meters, um, just checking for corrosion and. Different things like that, right? Mayor, Councilmember Thompson. Yes, all right. We're not. We're not going to. We're not talking about maybe in five years. We're not going to need meter readers anymore. They're going to be repurposed because even though there's a device, it's a meter. It's a mechanical device. It's going now. It's going to have a a register on it that's electronic. As we know that sometimes they, they may fail. There may be tampering. Most likely, it's going to be tampering or. Meters just might stop running or somebody might turn the valve off or whatever. So yeah, we're still gonna per repurpose that staff to be out there maintaining that system to make sure that it's operating, make sure it's accurate. Um, just because we're gonna have um, an AMI system, an automated system, doesn't mean that we're still not gonna get maybe the calls and complaints about the concerns of you sure my meter's working. That's, that's inherent and so we're gonna, we'll repurpose that staff for that. Jake, are we seeing um, much tampering on the power side or on the, on the uh, natural gas side? Not so much as we do on the water, and that's kind of um, gone back ways, but we do from time to time, we'll, we'll get some usage. We've got some, we've got some areas in the downtown Mesa area where the um, electric utility is in the alleys, so uh, they're hard to get to, but our meter readers have to get in there into those alleys and climb over walls or, and look at them. So whenever we identify something that's abnormal, whether it's on the gas system or the electric system, it's reported to our partners in energy and it's addressed. So we'll have first two months of um, um, operation from for Signal Butte will be coming this this fiscal year, and we're until we're programming in the first you know, the O and M budget for eighteen nineteen will be about three point two million dollars, and you'll see on this slide we have sixteen authorized positions currently twelve have been filled, and like we said the challenges that we have with recruiting and then retaining our employees, uh, we still have a couple of vacancies, um, and to the conversation that we had earlier about the demand. This, this plant coming online will be 24 million gallons a day. The plant has, has the capacity to expand in the future another 24 for a total 48 MGD. Uh, going back to what our water costs are, this slide is telling you, you can see the dark blue and the green. Uh, the dark blue is the cost of the water. It's actually the, the wet commodity. And then you have our capital components for the infrastructure, and that's our total cost per acre foot. And those are the, well, you can see that. And then over here, you have um, the SRP on the other side of this part of the slide. You can see where our projected uh, usage um, needs are from SRP. As I said earlier, we're anticipating a 5% increase because that's been typical, but they have not set their rates and we have not seen that yet. Expenses are rising. Um, we had some back in 2015 and 16, or 15, 16, and fiscal years 15, 16, and 16, 17, we did have some operational save, savings, as I was uh, talking earlier about. A lot of that is the um, commodity costs with regards to electric and the water, and the chemicals, where we saw some savings there. Um, actually, in 15, 16, we actually had about, we had some excess water that we had ordered, but we weren't gonna need. 
So we were able to remarket that for about a million dollar savings back in uh, 15, 16. <coughs> but for the most part, uh, we, we try to, through you know, optimization and, and using the electricity off peak hours, we r regularly see um, savings in electrical costs and um, chemical savings, but we don't anticipate having a savings this year with regards to the chemicals because of the, the amount of chemicals that are being used. So. And this is typically, this slide is a, is a partner to the one that I just went to, but the, you can see in 17-18, uh, the adopted budget is a little bit higher. Mostly that's regards to Signal Butte. It's not just, it's just the staffing. It's all the tools that we're gonna need, the equipment we're gonna need, uh, the utility cards to get back and forth, uh, the furniture for the consoles, for the operators, and all that stuff is, that's what's driving that uh, increase. Okay. Our wastewater business objective is but not only do we provide quality water to our citizens, but we have to take that um, water that is um, put off a side into the collection system. We try to treat that, we treat that to A plus uh, effluent. And so we try to use that for beneficial reuse in Mesa as well as our obligation to the Gila River Indian community where we have an agreement where we provide our effluent for them in exchange for uh, water resources. Um, some of our performance metrics for the collection system is that the, the value of the collection <coughs> system is it's not a pressurized system, but it does take, it's not like clean water that's under pressure and gets pushed, so it's 90% it's gravity fed. And so we have to clean, um, clean and inspect it on a regular basis. So based on the size of our system, which is about 1,700, um, we try to get to about 26 miles a month in, uh, cleaned and 20% 20 uh, 20 of the system inspected per year. There for a while we were doing pretty good with this metric, but as the size of the system is growing, it's getting more and more difficult. So we requested for, and the city manager's office has granted us, we're bringing on an additional wastewater crew. We think this metric will improve. Um, and then with regards to the cleaning, we're gonna get more people in the field. Currently today we have four large vector trucks that do our cleaning processes but whenever we get a call for maybe roaches in the sanitary sewer system or an odor complaint, that crew gets pulled off from its primary objective of cleaning to go out and take care of those customer service issues. So bringing on some additional staff to handle those areas, we'll be able to refocus that, those larger um, industrial crews to focus on the metric of keeping the system clean. And that's the benefit that we have with, with our, our sanitary sewer overflows. Um, for a system our size with the AWWA, the metric should be you should have no more than one sanitary sewer overflow per 100 miles of pipe. So that for a city of Mesa side, that would be 17 per year. As you can see, our target is zero. We don't like to see any of the wastewater come out of where it's supposed It needs to stay in the pipe and go where it needs to go. We don't want it on the ground uh, or in playgrounds or in the streets. So our target is zero. Right now, we're currently at about 1.6. We don't have too many... Even though our system is older, we're not like the East Coast where, you know, where, where it's been there for a couple hundred years and they're having our problems. So I think we do an effective job of maintaining our system. Um, okay. With regards to the inspections, we do that, and Beth mentioned this earlier, um, we do have a, one camera vehicle that we go out and we do about six miles a day and where we just run the camera down the pipes. We get an idea of what, what the issues are, whether it's clean, whether there's some defects, and we use that. And so, but this is older technology. It's a, the camera van's probably about tw almost 20 years old. It's older technology, it's analog. And so we take it back, we take the disc, we, then we send it back and then we have to review it. Um, what we're, we're anticipating in, in fiscal year 17, 18, we're targeting a newer van to, which is gonna be digital technology where basically we'll be able to take a snapshot Rather than you know taking you know 45 minutes to go through a half a mile of pipe, we can go through four miles of pipe in a matter of minutes because we're just going to take that thing down. It's a digital camera, a 360 digital camera is going to go down. We're going to have the data. We'll take it back and analyze it in quicker time, so it'll be more efficient. We'll be have a better understanding of the conditions of our system to be able to maintain it more effectively. Effectively. Another slide that shows about the the increase in of the system. Uh, for the last few years, currently we have about 1,700 miles of main. So uh, that metric with the AWWA, um, we have to maintain that line. And so we have to, have, have to clean and inspect so many different miles. So 
also with the addition of that, we're, we've got, we have to main, um, we have additional lift stations. Lift stations are where the gravity system gets to a point where it can't be gravity anymore. You have county lower, so we have to build a lift station to be able to lift that water back up to a higher elevation and keep the system going from east to west, north to south. And also with that, you know, we have odor control facilities because, you know, when we have water, wastewater reclamation plants and we have sewer lift stations in areas where there's, you know, neighborhoods or businesses or whatever, there's always inherent odors or even just concerns. So we have to, you know, fund and build um, odor control facilities to mitigate those, those complaints and those odors. Significant budget changes was the 91st Avenue um, water treatment plant. Our cost, that's $250,000 or an additional cost for what currently what we're paying. That's just our share of the plant, of those operations. Um, the Greenfield Water Reclamation Plant, a joint venture um, of that plant that we were talking about, that expansion, 127, um, <clears throat> excuse me, 127. Should that be a million? Yeah, this is. Thousands. 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 Operational costs. These are oper oh, I'm sorry. Me, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, these are All operational right. dollars. Yeah. Right. And then preventative maintenance with additional um, $75,000 for these are like skate items and stuff that we need to re repair and replace switches and stuff like that so we can maintain the system. Um, and the three wastewater collection systems. So that's 372000 but that's a, that's not just for the three. That's going to be take... Um, Ongoing cost for the um, the staff and the salaries, and one-time cost for all the equipment and trucks and vehicles that they're going to need for that crew. Our operational, we well, see here's our net sources and uses. You can see that we've seen some savings throughout the years in 15, 16. Um, we had, um, we do, we, since we are a partner in 91st Avenue, which is the Shrog system, um, they set a, they set a budget operation maintenance budget every year and we have to pay our portion of it. So every once in a while that something, you know, we might re recognize some savings in the overall program where there will be money dollars refunded to the Shrog cities. And so we've had some refund settlements with regards to our operational cost at, in, in uh, other years with regards to uh, 91st Avenue, and again, electrical and chemical savings. Yeah. Yes. Um, where are the uh, projections for the sources and uses for the next uh, five years that we're projecting? Is that presented to us previously in a different slide? No, uh, that'll be presented after. Once the uh, mayor and uh, council member Whitaker, once the departments uh, go over their budget uh, presentations, uh, Candace will come up and we'll then do the enterprise fund as a whole and show the projections. So that's later in the presentation. Got it. Thank you. Again, this slide is showing that um, we'll have some vacancy savings um, be due, due to the difficulty in recruiting and retaining staff. So those are some of the savings that we expect to see in the next year. This, this slide is how do we compare with neighboring cities. Um, so We've, what we've added in here for the first year, we're talking about, uh, we've got about 4,100 residents in Mesa that are served by um, Arizona Water Company. And we've got, um, so we're kind of fit, did, comparing ourselves, this slide is the comparison of what the, what the value of Mesa's water is, water services are compared to surrounding communities. And uh, we have Johnson, Johnson um, Utilities doesn't really um, provide service to any of our residents, but they are they do supply uh, wastewater services to neighboring cities. So these were added in as a comparison to um, Valley cities and what the value of our water and sewer services are. And with that, thank you for your time. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Rodia. Question on uh, the as these major projects come in come online, is there any savings or are we always chasing? Kind of structure uh, infrastructure costs, um, so like like Signal Butte and Greenfield. Um, is there any savings that then we can add? I see the water mesas, the highest uh, comparison uh, compared to other cities. Uh, so, do we realize any any savings that, as these projects come online? Um, Council Radio, Mayor and Council, actually, it's. Um, creating the opposite effect it is. Um, because again 2014 we 
added our 60%, 70% into a $580 million capital improvement program, most of which was related to the Signal Butte and the Greenfield plant. That capital cost, and you can even see it in, even in the water chart, you can see that chart that um, they showed at that summary, and you'll see it late, later on, how the debt service costs continue to rise. That is putting the pressure on the um, finances of the utilities, both in water, wastewater, um, and the others, but specifically water and wastewater, you'll see the greatest pressure on uh, the finances, the bottom line, is coming from these new big plants that are coming on board, and that puts pressure on the rates. Um, it's helping us, what it helps us to do, though, the offset of that, is it allows us to grow. It allows us to bring on large industry large, and allow large subdivisions to continue to grow. Um, and expand without having any restrictions as far as um, development because we have the ability to provide the water and wastewater. But again, as I mentioned before, that cost gets spread across the entire city um, as opposed to in the past where we were able to have impact fees that would be associated directly with the new improvements that are associated, or new development associated with that new improvements. We no longer, longer have that ability to do that, and so these rates <coughs> and the cost of capital get spread th throughout the entire system. Some of it will be offset in the future as we're able to, as we're seeing the expansion of our utility customers, Jake, so that kind of helps, obviously. The more customers we can have onto the system, that helps to spread the cost out, and so that's why we're pretty aggressive <coughs> about you know expanding our um, utility customers, whether it's on the industrial side or whatever, because they then become part of and sharing in the cost of um, making payments here. Okay. So you had mentioned, Jake, uh, as far as well extractions, uh, so the like Signal Butte coming online, would that take off what we have to pay then to extract from well, wells in, in the city? So is there anything that yeah, there, there's there's a balance council like member. Right? Those yeah. examples. There's there's a ba there's a balance there. We anticipate once we bring on that additional 24 million gallons a day, that's going to be less pressure on the wells that we have in that area, and not as well as the pressures that we have with regards to the Brown Road water treatment plant. Now they work in they're both taking the same source up on the north east part of Mesa. You've got the turnout there that provides the water to that plant, and now we've got the new turnout structure down in southeast. Currently, without Signal Butte online. What we do is we have to push all that water from Brown Road down south. We call it pressure mounding, which we overpressurize the pipes to be able to get that water to go down south. There's a cost to that, mm -hmm. and especially at Brown Road. 90% of the water that Brown Road, or 100% of the water that Brown Road treats and then pushes out into the system is done through pumping. We're either pumping it south or pumping it east, and most critically is we're pumping it all up into Los Angeles where you see those reservoirs up on top of the hill. It's really what's, that's where the, the typical costs are. So with regards to wells down in Southeast Mesa, that's expensive water because we're, we're cutting into our, our banking account and the Arizona Department of Water Resources regulates how much water we should be using. And the more that we use, it takes away not only from our, our, our recovered water that we have and we try to hold on to, to it, it comes at a cost. Yes, with the new plant coming on, we should see some <coughs> savings in a sense, but it's still they're still costly to maintain the system. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Chris, I know a few years ago we um, the council uh, increased our water rates more s to push water uh, conservation um, mm -hmm. more so than than the rates. But when I was looking at our at our cost, our water charge, you know, per resident, I mean we're Gosh, we're almost um, double um, what Phoenix is. And I, they, I don't know. I, I'm trying to figure out what that, why we're so much higher. Where are you looking? Um, what slide are you looking at? Uh, I'm on the. I'm actually looking at the annual annual cost comparison. Yeah, I'm at the attachment um, one homeowners comparison for oh. fiscal year 17-18. And we're higher, even on solid waste, water, wastewater, we're high, so, way higher than Phoenix. Right. So remember, take, you need to take about 20% of that is related, 20, 25% of that is related, 20% is probably related to the transfer. So if you just look at just what, how 
the water, actual water, wastewater, the utilities, we're kind of in the middle of the range once you take off the transfer. So the transfer, the $100 million, $108 million, adds on to the cost of water, all the utilities. But if you, so if you want to just compare um, really just the cost of what we takes us to provide water, it's not any different than anybody else. But okay. because we include on, on top of that the return back to the general fund, I, and I would say it's about 20% overall, um, that's where we see the biggest difference between us. I, once you take that off, we're right in the middle of the we're pack the for the okay. whole valley. Right. Okay, perfect. Mr. Whitaker. On slide 16, um, it, your budget is showing a loss of $900,000. Do you plan on balancing the budget uh, moving forward, or what's the plan as far as that goes? I, I, how long do you believe that you can sustain that? So, Mayor and Council, we sh we're showing you water separately, but the way we manage this fund is we manage it with all of the different um, departments, elements, funds inside of it. So um, because we do that, because there are times, for example, debt service on one particular, what it may be water, maybe much higher in one year um, and lower in a, a later year. And so we kind of try to balance this out between water, wastewater, gas, electric, solid waste. And so we try to create a system where we try to balance out sometimes there's spikes and capital, equipment, um, what else, Candace? Other elements, so we try to balance that out through the whole system, so, and at one year you may see a, a, a net loss, but overall in the whole system, we just try to continue to balance it out. Correct, uh, Mayor, Council Member Whitaker, when we're, when we're looking at that, we need to remember that when we issue bonds, we issue utility revenue bonds, and so while our bond uh, is structured overall, how much we issue in each given year may have more principal due in water one year, more principal due in wastewater another year, more principal due in uh, natural gas. And that will skew their annual net sources and uses, which is why we uh, manage the fund as a whole. And so we'll go over that when we get to the end. Um, and you'll be able to see um, the trends over time, as you asked about kind of that going out five years, you'll be able to see those trends actually for the water when you look at their, their debt is actually coming up in about two or three years. Their debt will, the debt portion related to water will actually increase as we start paying off more principal. And you actually see that we'll get um, more negative. We'll go no more negative. And then you'll see solid waste who was negative for a couple of years as we transition their CNG vehicles, we have additional capital costs. Those will actually come back up and they'll be born in the positive now. So that's why we manage the whole fund with all of the businesses. So some will go negative one year and some will go negative a different year depending on what's going on, capital costs, debt service, that type of thing. So as a whole, the budget will be balanced? As, as a whole, we're maintaining the fund, the, the fund balances between the 8 to 10%. But not net uses. There, I think in the out years you still see a net loss in we some did. years. Right, so as we go through, even with the recommended rate adjustments, you will see that there is a decrease in the net uses and revenues and sources. But we try to manage that fund balance because we recognize there are times um, that we need to actually, anticipating large draws on uh, debt service, that we need to build up those reserves so we don't create these spikes in rates. And that's been a very insignificant um, part of our rate structure is to provide for predictability in rates over a long period of time so that in the past we had had um, times where rates would go from 2% one year to 6% and it was very difficult uh, to manage that and also the impact on the rate pair. So we've tried very hard to create kind of for all the years going out, keep rates low, but also try to keep them in a predictable as low as possible so they're predictable every year going out. So, and again, as we get towards the, we kind of wanted to let you have the, um, have each department come and talk about their budget like any other department would, make sure that they're able to talk about their challenges and their opportunities and what's going on. And then we were going to kind of wrap it all up at the end, but we can actually show you the forecast. It is, I believe, attachment three um, in the item. So attachment three has, that's our cash flow for all of the enterprises. So it has the enterprise as a whole, and then it has it broken down into each one of the business entities. And you can see those um, if you go into attachment three on the agenda. 
So the goal is to balance the budget or it's not to be balanced? The goal, as, as we stated at the very beginning, is to um, manage our uh, reserves um, so they don't fall below 8%. We try to shoot somewhere between 8 and 10% um, and try to anticipate a, a, a long-term uh, goal of maintaining that reserve over time. There will be t years where um, the um, net, you, there'll be net losses, but we try to maintain the reserves um, to uh, imagine or anticipate those times so that we can have over a, a long period of time, we will maintain a positive reserve balance. That's what we're trying to achieve at the end of the day. So because we start, we start out with a significant um, uh, fund balance, but the actual revenues and expenditures in one year may be that it's a greater, because of debt service or whatever, it may be higher, it may be a net loss, but we are absorbing that in our reserves. And as long as our reserves maintain uh, that eight to 10%, uh, we consider that as our first objective. To your point, we would, yeah, that's what when all our funds, we would love to get kind of net zero of, of, of revenues and expenditures, but the nature of utilities, the nature of a lot of things to do with, because we have very large, we have to anticipate large one-time expenditures and impacts to our budget. Um, sometimes it's difficult to build in that kind of uh, fluctuation um, and revenues. Our revenues don't adjust dramatically like that for one-time projects, and so we try to build that in over a longer period of time. That makes sense. And then uh, Mayor and Councilmember Whitaker, each each year, as even though we set the budget, each year we're very diligent in the financial management of all of the funds, including the Enterprise Fund. And so if you actually look in the uh, 15 or 16, 17 actuals that are in this particular slide, you can see that we actually ended at a positive um, net sources and uses. That was not the original budget. Um, and that was due to us looking at the debt service and what we could uh, refinance through uh, lower interest rates. And so we're very diligent on looking at the financial management and taking advantage of any opportunity that comes along. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council. Additional questions for these folks? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. We'll pick up the pace here. Scott's been, yeah. been warming up over there. He's limber, <laughs> agile, and, and Frank's going to go get in the starting box because he's going to sprint. <laughs> yeah, I think, well, he had to go get warmed up. He had to stretch out a little bit. Good morning, Mayor, Council. Uh, Scott Boucher, the Environmental Management Sustainability Director. Um, I have with me also Sherry Collins, who's our Senior Fiscal Analyst. So she's the one who knows all the numbers behind the slides that we have today. Um, in the interest of moving along, I'll just jump right into the presentation. Um, first is just to give you a quick update on our Household Hazardous Materials Facility. Uh, if you look to the left, that's a rendering that we've shown you in the past of that facility. And if you look to the right, that is a picture from last week of where we are at on the construction of that project. Uh, we are set to open, we're still on schedule to open that in the fall of 2018. So this month we'll be holding our last household hazardous waste event and we'll start the transfer process over to having a full-time facility. Uh, you can see some of the um, things that we measure with the facility and we'll continue to measure those or what we measure with the events, we'll continue to measure those with the facility and uh, report back to you on the, the success of that facility as it opens. Um, the next slide gets into our energy efficiency. So if you look, these are the top three projects that we completed in 2017 uh, with our partners, both in water resources and facilities. Uh, you can see the savings that are associated with those projects. And then if you look down below, our performance measure is kilowatt hours saved through energy conservations. Now this is all of the energy efficiency projects that we've done since we began tracking these in about 2009, 2010. And so you can see the, the savings, the monetary savings that's associated with those projects and also the kilowatt hours. And then we tried to put it into some perspective as far as what that would equate to as vehicles driven uh, with the greenhouse gas emission reductions associated with that. Question on that. Uh, so the capital investment that was required uh, to actually do those projects, how many years based on the savings that you're projecting, does that actually pay for itself? Um, it, it's a very good question. And so if you look at like the Northwest Water Reclamation Plant LED lighting <coughs> retrofit, that is, that is a project, our lighting projects are usually our greatest payback projects. 
Um, that's about five years. So the capital cost for that was $228,000, and it's about $44,000 a year in savings. It's five years. Now, the tougher ones are when you look at the HVAC and the building automation system projects, these are end-of-life projects. So in other words, the, the HVAC and the building automation system that's in place is at the end of its life. It's no longer usable. It, um, you know, a lot of the building automation systems that we have uh, are 19... 90s technology and so you can't even get replacement parts for the building automation systems what we try and do is we work with our partners in in facilities is look at the delta in between a like for like so to speak even though you can't go back to that 90s technology because it doesn't really exist anymore um, but trying to look and find that sweet spot for what investment are we going to make and what savings are we going to get from that additional investment into energy efficiency? And we look on it on a project by project basis. I think one of the things you'll see that the picture of the award there is we were municipality of the year with SRP, and that's because of the partnership that we have with them in these energy efficiency projects, because they provide rebates for these projects because they're trying to lower their demand. And so we, we try and look at it on a project by project basis in, in that regards. Uh, next slide is uh, <coughs> renewable energy. So this is a snapshot of four of our solar installations that we have. Now these four solar installations were all done under the Solar Services Agreement model where we partnered with uh, Solar City. You'll see from these, we try and find a sweet spot on these where we're about 70, 75% of the building's energy usage. Uh, you don't want to overproduce because with the SSA model, you are paying for that energy. All of these projects, I will say, had savings from day one. So we were paying less for the solar than what we would pay for the conventional energy from SRP. Now, in addition to that, though, all of these projects had an incentive from SRP associated with them that SRP no longer offers those incentives. Um, so we tried to find those sweet spots within these buildings. Uh, the one that you'll see that maybe overproduces is at 103%. Uh, that is our Fiesta PD station. That was a new build when we installed the solar onto that facility. Uh, it's also a lead facility, so what happened is we were working with engineering on energy usage projections when the building would come online. Uh, the building is actually operating more efficiently than what we had anticipated with some of those lead standards that we had put in place with that building. And so we're right about, you know, it, it's, it's actually a, a net zero building, so to speak, uh, for the, the usage there. Um, and so this is just a good snapshot of, of what it looks like with ours. And you'll see one of the projects that we're working right now with the facilities group is on the multi-gen center. And so what we hope to see is we'll come back in a year or two, and if I showed you the same graph, you'd see this somewhere around that 70 75% usage uh, for the multi-gen center once we do a lighting, HVAC, and building automation project there. We're anticipating that energy usage is going to come down. Hmm? Excuse, excuse me, Scott. Yes. Uh, so these projects were all done under the old uh, incentives that were available for uh, solar energy. I, I've heard recently some of that there's been changes and the, you know some of the proposed projects that we talked about, the, the shade structure, for example, at the Performing Arts Center. Uh, others, it, it's, it's more difficult for these projects to be financially viable. Is that true? Yeah, so when you look at it from the the, you know, what we looked at for a viable project in the past for solar was that it had savings from day one, so that we were paying less for the renewable energy than when we were paying for the conventional energy. What came into play with that is the incentive that SRP would provide. So when you look at these four, I believe all of them were getting a four cent per kilowatt hour incentive. And what SRP does is they buy the renewable energy credits with that four cents, and they actually provide that to um, Solar City. They, they pay that four cents to Solar City, who is the SSA partner with us. So we're paying somewhere between six and seven cents a kilowatt hour to Solar City for the energy produced from the solar, and then SRP in addition is giving them about four cents. So it ends up in that 10, 11 cent range that they're getting per kilowatt hour for those systems and, and what energy is produced from them. Now, with that incentive going away, Obviously, the solar provider still needs to have a rate of return associated with their investment, and so what we see is that that ends up going more to the, the customer, of course, because there is not an incentive available from the electric utility SRP in this case. So with those incentives no longer being there, it's going to be difficult for, I think there's a, a public demand for more renewable energy projects, but it seems like it, 
it's tough for us to financially uh, it, rationalize them at this point. It, it, it is, and uh, we've had conversations with some of our neighboring cities who have sent some of, set some of these renewable energy goals, and they understand that there is a premium that needs to be paid sometimes in order to reach those goals. What we're doing is trying to look, we continue to look at different projects within the city of Mesa and where it can make sense. The larger the size of the system that we could put in, the the uh, better the financials typically look. So if we have large energy using uh, facilities that have excess space associated with them, um, and one of the ones that we've had some discussions with our water resources partners is at the Brown Road water treatment plant and the potential of maybe doing a project there. But again, the, the savings with that project would be I would say minimal. Uh, when you look at what the budget is, we just got done looking at the water resources budget, and when you're saving a couple of thousand dollars a year on their electric bill, it really isn't a huge savings. But if it's something where we can produce renewable energy and keep our costs relatively the same from that, um, those are projects that we're, we're interested in, in, in doing. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Whitaker. Have we spoke to SRP at all to try to work out uh, like a custom PPA agreement where they would be willing to pay us a certain amount per kilowatt hour that if we built projects large enough that we could justify the financial investment cost? Or are we just like every other customer to SRP where we have no leverage to be able to ask for higher compensation for we, solar? We have had conversations with them. They have expressed to me that they, because from their financial standpoint, that they're trying to keep rates lower for their customers also, um, they kind of set Palo Verde almost as that, as that mark for them of what they're willing to pay. And so, you know, we're looking at a three, four cents per kilowatt hour is what they're telling us that they want to come in at. So what they're looking at is much larger solar installations that you're seeing multiple megawatt, large, you know, 100 megawatt projects that are going in. Um, in remote locations that aren't necessarily the smaller locally generated, whether it be rooftop or ground mounted or carport structure type things that we're, we would be able to do with the amount of land that we have. So it would have to come back at three to four cents. SRP is not willing to budget all in those numbers. SRP has not expressed an interest in, in paying much more than what they're able to get energy for currently. Oh, okay. I, th I think you did say something significant there, which is if, if there is a desire on the part of this council and the desire on the part of the community to look for more renewable energy options, the, the financially viable way to do that would be to go to Salt River Project and say, hey, we want to partner with you on a large scale uh, industrial, you know, wholesale level uh, uh, solar production facility out in the desert somewhere. We'll pass a bond, chip in. X number of millions of dollars and be X percent owner in that project, right. something along those lines. Mayor, they actually have offered that we wouldn't have to issue a bond. They would, um, they would sell us the power, but then there would be a premium, a premium that they would be associated with that. So, if, I mean, at some point, if council is interested in creating that, there, there may be you know an interest that even if it, and I don't know what how much of a premium we would talk, you know, what it is. I haven't we haven't gotten that far. But if there's an interest, because I think those costs are going to come down. So I don't know that, that pre how long does that premium last. But I, I think there's an opportunity to negotiate with SRP if we want to increase the portfolio of energy source for Mesa, for Mesa residents that are SRP customers. SRP is certainly open to the idea, and I think they would actually in, in, um, welcome it as an opportunity to provide that. Now they are just going to look and say for uh, Mesa to have that additional renewable energy portfolio, um, the premium may be what, I don't know what the cost would be. And they would absorb all the util the, sorry, the additional debt and the capital. They would, that's something they would take on. We would just be paying for it through um, additional rate increase. So we just have to commit to buying X right. amount it would be a negotiated renewable energy. percentage of what comes into Mesa, whatever that goal is. And then they would tell us, then that's gonna cost the average taxpayer, or sorry, rate payer, I don't know, whatever it is, so many percentages more. And you know, at some point, if that's interest, we, we haven't gone any further than that, so I don't know what, you know, it's always gonna be, if you wanna add 30% more, how much is that gonna cost, you know, the average 
repair, I don't know, but at some point, if council is interested, we can go have those conversations, at least bring back to council and say, do you think the average rate payer would be willing to pay $2 more or a dollar more or I, I don't know, maybe it's 10, but whatever the percentage is, we could certainly um, have that conversation. And SRP then is in the business and they, I think they're working with some very large scale solar um, uh, resources, especially up with the closing of the, um, NGS. yeah, the NGSs. And so I, there's an, there may be some opportunities early on to get into those early, but again, there will be a cost. I can't quantify that, but it's, it may be something we may want to look into. Well, it seems like a good idea to have those conversations. I mean, we don't know what our level of interest is, I would guess, until we know what the price tag would be, sure. but it, it might be interesting to explore that. We can do that. Yep. Thank you. Um, our next slide, you will see this is, um, I would say this is the biggest pressure that is, is upcoming for the solid waste utility, and it is recycling. We have seen dramatic changes in the recycling market over the last several years. Um, and we also have contracts that are coming up with our recycling partners that run the recycling facilities that we deliver our recyclable materials to. Um, as you see from the chart, um, back in fiscal year 2012-13, uh, we had over a million dollars worth of revenue that was generated from our recyclables. And that was checks that were cut to the city of Mesa from our recycling facilities. Um, we are projecting out into 1920 that that's actually going to switch, that it's going to be an expense of almost a million dollars to recycle those materials. Um, while you see in those years where it's pretty steady, we had contracts previously that had a floor price associated with them. So we had a floor price with our largest recycling partner of $26 a ton. So at a minimum, the city of Mesa would be paid $26 a ton for every inbound ton that we brought into that facility. Um, they, all of our recycling partners have expressed that they will no longer enter into contracts that have floor prices associated with them. What the market is now doing is they're having contracts that have a processing fee associated with them. Uh, it can be anywhere between 60 to $85 a ton is what we're seeing right now as a processing fee. And then there's a revenue share portion to it. Um, and that revenue share can be anywhere between 60 to 75 percent, that the city would receive 60 to 75 percent of the revenue that, from the commodity that is sold. To give you an idea, with our other contract, the floor price is $26, and we get a 26 percent share of the revenue, so whichever one is greater. Um, with the market conditions currently, um, at about what we projected here was at about $100 a ton, which I think in the last couple of months we've been getting about $105 per ton from these recyclable materials. Um, so this is about what we're seeing now. And with those processing fees in place, it is a dynamic that is switching to where recycling now is going to have a cost associated with it as opposed to a revenue. So this is more good news. Yes. Um, like the. Uh, yeah. That's what we're here for. Uh, um, does this reflect, though, I mean, when we do send uh, waste to recycling rather than to the landfill, we save money by not paying for the landfill. So do, do these, does this deficit reflect any savings for. Well, and, and that's portion of it. So when you look at 1213 in that million dollars worth of revenue. In addition to that, we had somewhere between eight, nine hundred thousand dollars in avoided cost associated with that because we didn't have to send it to the landfill. Um, when you look at a nine hundred thousand, you know, what is it, nine hundred and thirty five thousand dollars in expenses, to give you perspective, to landfill that material would cause uh, cost us about nine hundred and ninety thousand dollars. So it is almost the same cost to landfill it is what it would be to recycle it. The thing is though is there's, and, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news on these things, but there's also efficiencies that the city could gain if things were landfilled because you could, you don't have to run two different routes, you don't have to have all the other costs that are associated with it. Um, so this is something that is in a, a changing market. Uh, I think one of the things that we're going to see is we're gonna have to start looking at what's in that blue barrel and identifying what has real value to it and what does not. And so an example I'll give you is glass. Glass is the heaviest material that we put into that blue barrel. Um, and when you're paying a fee of 60 to $85 a ton to process it, and then at the end, it has no value to it. In other words, nobody is willing to pay money for it. 
And I've even seen some of the, the information that our partners have given us where it has a negative value associated to it, which I don't quite understand, and I'm trying to get an explanation of how it has a negative value. Um, what, at what point do we then say it's worthwhile to actually uh, recycle this material, or is it something that, from an economic standpoint, would be better off not, not to be in the blue barrel? Thank you. You need to hit your microphone. Mr. Luna. Uh, Scott, is, uh, this is obviously not just a Mesa issue, it's a regional issue. Is there something that we could do regionally to try to work with these four companies? Because certainly we, we, we want to recycle. We want, the, we want our residents to recycle. It's, it's a good thing to recycle. But these are, it's getting cost prohibitive. Yes, Mayor, Vice Mayor Luna, uh, we're actually having conversations with our partner cities and, and with our recycling partners on this and trying to look at different ways that we can deal with recycling and looking at um, one of the things that, that we're having the discussions of is what, what has value, really looking at what's in the barrels, whether it's the blue barrel, the green barrel, and the black barrel. And then in addition to that, remember, we have a commercial side of the operation that we run where we've got bins and roll-offs, trying to look at what materials are in those uh, containers and what has value to it. What has real value to it that somebody is willing to pay for at the end? And maybe reassessing what, how we are doing these things so that we're taking the things that have real value to them and recycling those and things that possibly don't have the value, maybe those things are going to the landfill. And it's, it's not just a local issue, this is, this is a nationwide issue and it really becomes an international issue too because a lot of this is being driven by China. Most of our recyclable materials were going to China. China has put up what they call the green fence where they have made, um, so their allowable contamination rate for uh, material going into their country, they have dropped down to a 0.5% contamination rate. We're being told by many of our recycling vendors that they can't meet that contamination rate at this point. Um, you know, even other news, we've, we've had some materials such as cardboard where we're not even getting bids for that material from folks. Where folks are saying, I, I can't take the material from you anymore because I don't have a market I can sell it to and therefore I'm not going to buy something if I'm going to lose money off of it. So they're just saying, they're, they're not bidding on the materials for us. And we haven't, we haven't seen that before. Scott, so in those situations, we're still paying for folks to separate out, and then that cardboard's going to the landfill. No, well, with it, it depends. So with our cardboard bins, what we're doing currently, so we have a cardboard program, and this would be our front load cardboard is where we're doing this, where we would typically build, bring it to um, somebody who is just taking cardboard and paper and turning that and selling this, bailing it up and selling it off. We're currently taking it to the MRFs, the, the materials recycling facility, and getting that $26 <coughs> per ton floor price for it currently. Um, and and that's, that's the most economical thing for us to do currently. Um, once those contracts go away, which would be in October of this year, um, then we'll have to reevaluate where we're taking that material to. The other thing we're trying to do is also do a lot of outreach to our cardboard commercial customers because most of them are filling up six and eight yard bins of cardboard. So this, these are businesses that deal with a lot of cardboard on a daily basis and trying to get them to remove because of the, the issue that our cardboard uh, recyclers are running into. So if you think about when you order something from Amazon and it has either styrofoam inside of it or now it's the air, you know, the plastic air bubble that's inside of there. Um, if that's inside the box and it gets compacted there's no way for that recycling facility to, to identify that and get it out of their stream because as it's going through, they're not looking in every individual box or if it's been smashed down and that air has come out. Now you've just got a thin layer of plastic inside a cardboard box. So we're doing a lot of outreach trying to talk to those customers about that material has to come out of the box beforehand. Otherwise, it's, it's just a, a um, you know, it, it doesn't have as much value to it. And I guess it's one of those things. A commodity is only worth as much as somebody's willing to pay for it. So. <clears throat> Mr. Glover. One quick question, Scott. So going forward, what would be the best items that if we were to limit in the blue barrel, what people can put in them, what would be those best items? What we have seen um, nationally is glass. Glass is the number one thing. 
Um, there's a lot of cities that have taken glass out of the blue barrel um, just because it's the heaviest material that there is and in all honesty has the least value to it. So when you look at the new model of a processing fee based on a tonnage basis and a revenue share, if it's the heaviest material but has the least value, it, it's not something that you would want in there. The issue is, and I'll be completely honest, we have trouble getting folks to put what they're supposed to put into the blue barrel currently with our contamination rates, and that's just being honest. So to tell somebody, I can remember as, as a child, the first thing I recycled were soda bottles. We were always allowed one soda a week and we put them into a container and then you would bring those, those glass bottles back. So if we're having trouble getting people not to put styrofoam and other materials into the recycling barrel currently, to tell them they can't put something in that they've been recycling their entire life is going to be a challenge for us. Um, so, you know, the outreach that we would have to do, and I think we're going to have to get to a point, too, where when we start doing inspections of the blue barrels, if people don't conform with what needs to go into the blue barrel, we might have to start taking blue barrels away uh, because the contamination, if, if we're not able to get somebody to purchase the material because of the contamination rates, we can't continue to collect it from residents and pay more than what it would be otherwise. Have you thought about imposing fines? Um, that's something we I, have thought about, but it hasn't been something that we have moved forward with. We get in trouble just for looking in people's barrels. Why? Wow. Just lots of calls to council members about invading people's privacy. Yes, people are very sensitive about their barrels. I have learned this over the years also. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we can uh, also give us a direction with that. Our experience has been. Right. I, I think what it becomes, though, is there's a, there's a real financial impact on it. And so we have to have a conversation in regards to if there's a financial impact to it, we, we have to do what we have to do or in order to, to make this material as clean as possible. That's the biggest thing that's happening right now is the contamination rates. I don't mean to change the topic. I'm still confused. How does the revenue go negative? Because we will pay. So if we have a processing fee, so you have, um, just say it's $65 a ton processing fee <coughs> that you are paying, and we bring 30,000 tons a year to a facility. There's, there's an amount of money that you're going to be paying. That's what, $1.82 million in processing fees that we would pay the recycling facility. And then they would give us a 60% revenue share of the commodity that is sold. And if you sell that at $100 a ton, on average, by the time you take out the contamination rate and residue associated with it, there's less tonnage that you're actually getting paid on. So now the tonnage that you're getting paid on somewhere between 20 and 25,000 tons, that revenue that they're going to give to the city of Mesa is going to be less than what the processing fee is. Oh, that's a decrease in revenue. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So in other words, we will be paying the recycling facility. I call staff. it an expense. Yeah, it's an expense. <laughs> yeah. And that's what it becomes. It, it switches from a revenue to an expense. But like we said, there, the, the, what's not reflected in this is the cost savings of not taking it to the landfill. Yeah, but it's getting there. But there. it's getting there. Yeah. So for yes. the, at least the next couple of years, right. we're losing money, but we're not losing as much as we're saving by not taking it to the landfill. But that gap is getting narrower and narrower. So maybe in a year or two from now, we'll have to ask ourselves the hard questions. Do we want to spend money to recycle? Right. And um, that is then driven by market conditions. And that's one of the things with the floor price, we're protected from some of the risk associated with it because there was a minimum amount we would receive per ton. Now we're going to be much more open to those market fluctuations in regards to the commodity prices. So if the commodity goes down, if we're projecting it $100 a ton here, if the, the price of those commodities drops down, say it's 90 or $80 a ton, it gets, you know, the, the expenses are worse. If it goes up to where it's $120, $140 a ton, we could flip this to where we actually are making money again. But the market is very volatile, has been forever. Um, and so it's just we are more open to that market volatility now than what we were in the past. 
But Scott, we, we could we could actually start losing money as quickly as October once the contract yep. is. That's, it, that's that delta that you see. You're right. correct, Mayor, um, Council Member Thompson. You're correct. That's why when you see the difference between 1819 and 1920 is because we have those three or four months where we're going to get that $26 a ton. Really, we, we didn't anticipate. The only change that we anticipated between 1819 and 1920 is that that contract goes away. That's the only difference between those numbers is those three months of revenue then that would then switch to an expenditure. But it was a great it was a great contract. I think that's the other thing. We're coming off a very good you know, arrangement for the city. And now we're just going to be subject to the ups and downs of the market. That was kind of a, our hedge against the market before. Yes. And, and, the, and, the con and the contractor got the benefit of the upside yes. of that. We just got protected on the bottom side. But now the commodities have all dropped to the bottom, and so they're not willing to take. Now it's a risk aversion on their part, so now we're going to, have, we're going to be exposed to the ups and downs of the commodity market. Mr. Glover. A few quick questions. How many blue barrels are there in the city of Mesa? Uh, so we have about 135. Let me get to, I have that in another slide here. Um, we have about 132,000 blue barrels. And if we were to go and inspect them, what would be the added financial burden to the city? We would probably, we, I, I haven't calculated those numbers, but we have what's called quality insurance inspectors that go out and look into those. Um, we would probably have to hire somewhere in the neighborhood of five to <coughs> ten more, depending on the frequency and the follow-up that we would do into those, those barrels. Okay. Have we uh, had any private conversations, or at least uh, not private conversations, <laughs> but conversations with private entities such as Waste Management and Republic Services on how they're handling this issue? Yeah, so those are our partners. They are the ones that are running the recycling facilities that we are bringing the material to. Uh, Republic Services actually just purchased this year ReCommunity, which is the recycling facility that takes most of our um, material at the Salt River Landfill. It's co-located at the landfill. They have purchased that um, facility. And um, they have similar issues that they run into as far as contamination rates. I will tell you that both Republic and Waste have told us that we have some of the cleanest material that they receive when we look at our audits and we look at the results, but we still have contamination rates that are somewhere in the 12 to 15 percent range. And though e even though when you compare us to other municipalities in the Valley and even looking nationwide, we're relatively clean in comparison to that, we're not where the market is demanding that we be. If Do they give sense. us more money if the if it's cleaner than it is, if it's not contaminated? What they're telling us is that that would be reflected in the tonnage price that we would receive. So it's different for each client that they interact with. I mean, does Mesa receive a different rate than Tempe? No, it, it does get. It's interesting because it gets mixed in together. So when you go to the facility in at the Salt River landfill, you'll see trucks from. Republic services that are going there. You'll see trucks from Mesa. You'll see trucks from Scottsdale that are delivering that material there. We are audited anywhere between a quarterly and annual basis, depending on our contracts and depending on how the, the partners want to arrange the audits that we do. When we do those audits, those audits set what we will get paid um, based on what the composition of the material is. So in other words, if we have, and it's interesting, because if you have an audit that has a large amount of cardboard in it, which is the most, which has the most value to it when it's clean, um, you will receive more money. You could have more contamination, but it actually is a better rate that you're going to get paid because that cardboard's worth more money. Whereas we've had other audits where we had a very low contamination rate, but for some reason we also had a low amount of cardboard as a percentage and we actually were receiving less money for those materials because it's, it's all based off of formulas that are put out. Does that make sense? Yes, kind of. But um, I have a better idea. I think the law of supply and demand says that if we decrease the supply of recycling materials, the demand from their side is going to go up, right? They're going to need more recyclable materials in order to sell them. So uh, how long was this contract period that just oh, expired? The one we have right now is about a, I think it was a five-year contract with renewables, renewals that are available. So do, what would we think about just taking uh, the blue trash cans and going and dumping them in the dump 
for a few months and then coming back and seeing if they are willing to negotiate a little more. I mean, like, we're the second biggest city up here in, in the Phoenix metro area. I got to imagine if we take away all of their supply, uh, that's going to start negotiations, right? <clears throat> Uh, Mayor, Councilmember Whitaker, and Councilmember Glover, to your questions. We've had some very progressive talks with both Republican ways to this point, but this comes down to risk as far as they're concerned. They would like to set a processing fee that means they break even, and all the market volatility falls upon us. They would take a much smaller percentage of the profit on the upside, but have no risk on the downside. What we've told them so far is that our council will not accept 100% of the risk in this situation. We are willing to be good partners. We're willing to share that risk with them, but we need a deal that sets us up so we both go together in the market volatility. Otherwise, they have no reason to find buyers because their costs are covered. So while we've never actually discussed with them the idea of shutting them down and, and just having everything go to the garbage for a while, we are trying to push them towards the idea that if we are 50-50 partners on this, we will continue to try to make this a viable option. If they expect the city to take all of the risk so that they have only upside, that is not a deal that we are interested in doing in the future. Have you considered just stop supplying them with material? Yeah, and so one of the, one of the things in the contract, and, and we do this both with our trash contracts and with our recycling contracts is we commit to a minimum tonnage to bring to the facility. And I have told both Waste and Republic as we've had these discussions that if this is the model we're going to follow, the days of the city committing a minimum tonnage for years in advance to bring to them is going to have to change also because that's one of the things. If we're continuing to lose money on it, I, I don't want to put us into a contract that we're required to continue to bring you that tonnage. And so one of the ways that we can protect ourselves is to not commit to a minimum tonnage. In other words, we'll bring you material if it makes sense for us to bring you material. If it doesn't make sense for us to bring you material, we won't bring you that material. But again, they, they, they don't like that because then that puts risk back onto them also as they're making capital investments into their re recycling facilities. So, it's a dynamic market that, that we are trying, and that's one of the ways in which we can do that is by not committing tonnage to them. Yeah, I think that's great. I say you take it to the landfill and see where the negotiations start, right? I mean, that's their entire business model. If you take away their supply, I'm sure they're going to come back with some more favorable terms. I, I would hope so. One of the things that scares me, though, is like with our cardboard, we actually have people that are telling us, don't bring it to us. We, we don't want it. And so... In a landfill? Huh? No, not to the landfill, but from a recycling standpoint. So we've already reached the point with some of these commodities where we have partners that we've partnered with for decades that have provided bids to us for this material. Now, sometimes those bids would go as low as $40 a ton and would be as high as $150 a ton, so there was market fluctuation. But we've actually reached a point where some of those are now saying, I just don't bring it. And so they're, they're doing it proactively to us as opposed to us telling us we won't bring it to you. Thank you. Mr. Luna. Uh, Mr. Bajay, I would urge you to be cautious because that would cause outrage in our community. Yes. We stop doing recycling. So as you market this, uh, make sure that you know, you tell them exactly what needs to be put in the bin. Do some <clears throat> magnet, do some sticker, uh, encouraging our, our members of our community to do that um, before we do anything that's drastic like that. Mr. Freeman. Scott, thanks for the good news. I feel like I'm buried now. Um, looking at the forecast at 1819 on slide 29, um, this is recycling revenue. Now, if you're running two routes, and you can explain it to me, uh, but if you're running the second route for recycling and it costs to deliver that service, does that mean that deficit or that budget line item is even more greater than 551,000 to run a second route to? Well, there is cost associated with running. So you're running that route today. But right. you're running two routes. And We're running. That doesn't, none of that changes. Incrementally, as far as the current operations, that wouldn't change. That's an additional cost, if that's what you're asking. Well, if, but it, if it you is eliminated one route. Oh, yeah. If we eliminate, I mean, we... Theoretically, it's a Jeremy's we could. point, if you eliminate, no, if we did a Jeremy's point, we weren't, all and we weren't doing any blue barrels at all, then yeah, we would just have everybody, it'd just be a black barrel pickup and a black and a green, and that right. would be it. Right. So 
But we would save, because I guess we still pick up the green, though. We do. In the green space, it's a whole other story that we didn't bring up here, but green is also a very high tipping fee that has been increasing also. But that don't is, ask. Uh, don't, don't, don't. I was but, going there yet, so no. but, And that is a service, though, that we do charge for currently. Uh, the green barrel. We charge half of what we do for the black barrel, but the green barrel is seeing similar pressures, mostly because of contamination um, and also because there's just not a market. So compost, there's, there's kind of a, a slug or a, a more supply coming in with compost, and so its value on the back end is not what it used to be. And again, when that value on the, on the back end of it becomes lower, the cost for the processor on the front end needs to go up because they're they're not making the money off the sale of the commodity. I I guess just to follow up to my question with the the deficit of five hundred and fifty one thousand dollars in recycling revenue and the cost to deliver that service, it could actually be much higher or that be the right word. For service? In addition to this cost, there is the cost of picking it up. If that's what you're asking, yeah, yes. I am. Yes, there is. The, we're not showing that. This is just the contract. Just the cost this analysis. Is, this is the the contract because we assumed, if we assume that we're going to be still picking up the blue barrels, as we have from the beginning of this graph Correct. through the end of this graph, that cost doesn't change. Correct. But to your point, if we just stopped all recycling pickup, we would you know, you save that route. That, I wasn't but suggesting. there's a cost. Just to clarify, I was saying just take the blue, bin, blue barrel, still and pick it up it, and bring yeah. it to the dump. I'm not saying you stop picking up the blue barrel because then people would actually notice that we're not <laughs> recycling, right? And if they don't notice, they're not paying attention. <laughs> and yeah. the contract becomes favorable, and then you take it back to the recycling <laughs> yeah. facility. For people watching. It, the other question is, are these costs being directly uh, attributed to the line item for recycling on the utility bills? Or are they being spread across? It really, the, the recycling is kind of embedded into the black barrel. We don't charge for the blue barrel. Um, so the, the cost associated with it, it kind of gets embedded into that black barrel. And remind me, does the blue barrel cost additional, or can you opt not to have a blue barrel when in, the, in our utility? You have to opt. You can, you can opt out of it, but there's no cost associated there is with no the cost. blue barrel. And even if you wanted a second blue barrel, there's no cost associated with that either. Um, and that has been because we would make money off of it uh, previously. <laughs> we encourage so it. we sure. encourage folks to recycle more. So should we create a line item in our utility bill that says recycling and actually start charging people for this? That way, if they want to be conscious and they can recycle, then have at it. They can pay for it. Otherwise, it's going to the dump. Yet that is one of the ideas that we have thought of, and I think one of the things that we're, we're going to need to come back, whether it's through a committee process, and it's interesting, I've been thinking about it, you know, from our standpoint, it's there's sustainability and transportation that we can come back to, but this also affects audit and finance, um, because this becomes a financial issue also. And so between those two committees, we can have some of these conversations about what do we do with this material. Um, because sustainability, you know, there's three pillars to it, and one of those pillars is financial, and that's the most immediate thing that you feel with sustainability is the financial impact associated with it. The but environmental have, benefits. You do have there. some great ideas about how to expand your sustainability programs. We we do have some. <laughs> We're just quickly moving through this slide. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on then. <laughs> so one of the projects that came up through Imagine Mesa, and to be honest, has been something that has been being discussed within the department uh, previously is food. Uh, food waste specifically and how that can be converted into it, to energy. So one of the discussions that we just had was the value of the commodity is only worth what somebody is willing to pay for it. And so looking at food waste, things that are happening nationwide is they are taking food, putting it into anaerobic digesters, producing biogas, and then using that biogas either to produce on-site energy at the wastewater treatment plants, which as you saw from the previous slides are high energy use facilities. Um, or another thing that has come forward over the last several years is to treat that to pipeline quality, put it into the natural gas system, and show its use in a natural gas vehicle. There is a thing called the Renewable Fuel Standard, which has 
associated with it these things that are called renewable identification numbers. So we discussed the RECs associated with solar, the renewable energy credits that SRP was paying an incentive for. Renewable identification numbers under the renewable fuel standard are similar to a REC, except they, they have more value to them currently. They are purchased by your large fuel producers, so your, your Chevrons, your Exxons, those types of folks that are large producers need to meet requirements for carbon emission reductions, and this helps them get that. They are basically buying compliance with these credits that are um, created. So we at the City of Mesa are unique, as we discussed through the CIP process uh, when Beth was presenting. We own the solid waste utility, we own the wastewater utility, we own the natural gas utility, and we have a very large CNG fleet that collects the waste currently. So we have, you know, we were discussing, Candace had brought up that we're in the process of converting over our fleet to CNG. So one of the things we're looking at, we've begun a feasibility study, we're working with our, our friends in, in water resources and energy resources, and we're just beginning the feasibility study of is there an ability to take material, pre-process it at the Center Street Yard, which is where our household hazardous waste facility is currently, create what's called a bio slurry, um, bring that to an anaerobic digester, feed it into the digesters, increase the gas production, and then either use that for on-site energy or use that to power our vehicles. Um, and that's one of the things that we are just beginning the feasibility study now, and we'll be coming back and reporting to you. Um, we're doing a couple of field trips over the next couple of months. We'll be sending out an email letting council members know if you're interested in attending these. Uh, in June, we're going to the San Francisco area, uh, specifically East Bay Mud. Uh, the East Bay Municipal Utilities District has been doing this with fog, flats, oils, and grease, and food waste for years. Uh, and we're going to tour, I believe it's three or four different wastewater facilities in the Bay Area that are currently doing this type of program. In addition to that, we're working with our partner, Waste Management. Waste Management is doing a pilot project. Their pilot project is 60 to 85 tons of food per day that they are bringing. They are producing a bio slurry and they're bringing it to the LA County Sanitation District, who has a, I believe it's like a 300 MGD wastewater plant that they are taking that material and producing biogas with it. And so we're looking at sometime in May, doing a tour of the LA area, and then sometime in June, we'll be going to uh, the San Francisco area and looking at how others have, are doing these types of programs. And then we'll be reporting back on, on this. Scott, I, lo I love the idea of the um, anaerobic digestion, but the scalable wise, as far as producing pipeline quality natural gas, um, to be able to scrub it, clean it, and then add the mercaptan, the stink, um, to it, is it, is it, when you go through your analysis, or at least on the front end right now as you're looking at it, is our cost um, per BTU comparable to what it's going to cost to scrub it and, and everything else? Yeah, the, the wild card factor, Mayor, Councilmember Thompson, the, the factor that comes in is the renewal, renewable fuel standard um, and the value of these renewable identification numbers, so RINs. Um, we've had a couple of conference calls and webinars that we've been participating in, workshops that we've gone to. Um, currently, a D3 RIN, which would come from an anaerobic digester without any food waste put into it, has a value, and you'll understand this, of about 30 to $35 an MMBTU which is a significant value. Your typical value, when I talk to, to Frank McQuarrie, he'll say $3 an MMBTU is, is, a, is a number for the actual commodity. But in addition to that, there's the renewable identification number where you have oil companies that are purchasing compliance, essentially. And that's where there's a real value to it. The issue is, and we just had a conference call yesterday talking about this, is there's some uncertainty with the renewable fuel standard and the current administration and how they're going to uh, implement this. This was actually something that was put in place by the Bush administration, or was implemented through the Obama administration, and now with the Trump administration, there's some question marks in regards to how this will be. They've talked about capping RIN values. Uh, they've, talked, they've given waivers to some of the smaller refineries, which, recre which reduces the demand for the RINs, which then reduces the price because you have more supply than what you have the demand. Um, but it's interesting because ethanol is a huge part that meets this renewable fuel standard. And um, that's produced in the Midwest by farmers who are, um, who were voting for 
Trump in the election, and so changes to this renewable fuel standard might have a negative effect on the farmers also. Um, but you've kind of got two lobby groups between the oil industry and the farming industry that are not in agreement on what should happen with this fuel standard. Um, so that's one of the big question marks that we're trying to evaluate. We've had conversations with Scott Butler. Um, we actually are now, there is a weekly um, newsletter that's going out on the renewable fuel standard. And I'm looking forward to getting my first copy of that tomorrow um, in taking a look and trying to track where this is going to be. That's where the real value of this would come from is from that renewable fuel standard. And what you have to show is that it's used in a vehicle. And because we have a large CNG fleet currently, we, and it's all within what I've referred to as the family, because it, it doesn't leave Mesa, um, we can show that. And then we don't have to involve any of the other utilities, and we don't have to get what a lot of people run into is you have to find a broker who will match up the supply and the demand for it. And that broker takes you know, money off the top of it from it. We have, if we can produce the supply and have our own demand for it, we don't need to have these brokers involved in it. The other thing you can do, though, is produce renewable energy from it. You can run it through a cogen. We currently have a cogen there, but we don't do treatment up front of it. And I think that's one of the issues that we're running into with being able to operate that cogen. And that's what we're hoping to learn as we go through these field trips, so to speak, as we go to other facilities. And so one of the questions I might come back to you is we set a renewable energy goal. If we can produce four or eight or 10 million kilowatt hours of renewable energy a year, but there's a cost to it, if that cost is less than what we would be able to get it from a, an SRP through a community solar, is that what we're interested in doing? And so, you know, this, this might be a situation where there is a little bit of a premium associated with it at the end, but if there is a large amount of renewable energy that comes with it, is, it's, is it council's desire to do that type of project? And I can't, all the numbers that we have right now, there's so many assumptions and there's so many ranges that are in there, that's why we need to do the feasibility study so that we can come back to you with some real numbers and really start talking about this would be the, the capital costs associated with it, this would be the operation and maintenance costs associated with it, and this would be the avoided costs associated with it. Well, on, the, on the fuel standards, maybe it's an opportunity to, to lobby uh, or to work with uh, APGA and um, our friends in, in DC, um, Boggs Patton, or Patton Boggs? Yes, Patton Boggs, that's who's gonna be sending me this, this uh, update letter or, or um, you know, newsletters that have different articles and where we're standing with the, the renewable fuel standard. And Scott, I, Butler, I, I'm assuming that we're already working with our congressional delegation on this, on these types of issues, items? Mayor, Councilmember Thompson, yes. Um, but this is exactly the type of feedback we need um, from council as, as you um, meet with members of the congressional delegation as Mr. Boucher and his team are looking at where we can affect federal policy on this. As he alluded to, a lot is changing in DC right now and a lot of the agency direction is changing. So we're trying to keep up with that. Um, we're lucky to be associated with, um, with a firm in DC that has a very broad grasp of these issues. And so uh, Squire Patton Boggs, as a global firm, is working on these, this, these kind of issues with multiple clients. And so we're able to benefit from their expertise. They, they have a whole department with hundreds of attorneys that work just on this type of, uh, just uh, this type of legislation, the, this type of policy. So we're gonna tap into all the resources that we have. Next slide. Please. All right. Um, another Imagine Mesa idea is bulk collection. I think this will go relatively quick. Um, there was desire from the committee to increase this service. This is a service when people call in um, that sometimes we have to push them back. We currently offer it two days a week. We're looking at offering it four days a week as a pilot while we'll hire a temp employee. Uh, we don't need any additional equipment. We can use the current equipment that we have. We'll just need one new employee and we're gonna do that on a temporary basis see if the demand is there for the service, if it's a sustained demand going forward. If it is, then we would come back next year, probably ask for a permanent employee and implement this as full-time that we would do four day a week bulk pickup. Uh, the other thing is um, we're rebranding the Clean Sweep Green Sweep program to the Neighborhood Cleanup program. Some of the feedback that we got was that Clean Sweep Green Sweep wasn't real clear on what that actually is, but I think Neighborhood Cleanup is pretty straightforward. It's an ability to clean up your neighborhood um, and so we're rebranding that and really looking at marketing that more and make sure that we're 
we're utilizing that program to its fullest extent and making sure residents are more aware of it. Um, challenges, now we talked about a lot of this already, the recycling market risk increases, uh, I think we talked about that a lot. Our barrel replacement program, so we do have, you know, similar to other, the other utilities, we have our aging infrastructure, our infrastructure becomes more of our bins and barrels, and so, um, you know, we're looking at how we can keep up with barrels that, that break over time, and um, that is a pressure on the utility. Uh, growth, of course, you know, as, as it continues to grow, we need to add more operators, we need to add more equipment, um, and then tipping free increases that we see, and then there's just some minor, um, you know, call out pay policy changes and, and um, CNG maintenance for our uh, fueling station that we have there. Uh, next one is our sources and uses slide. Um, you'll see, as we discussed previously, that the, the uses were higher than what the sources were over the last couple of years, but we're now coming out of that. Um, and that's where, you know, as I explained, we look at the enterprise fund as a whole. Some come out, some go in, and so we're looking at the enterprise fund as a whole. Um, but of course, the pressures that we just discussed, those are going to have a direct effect on our sources and uses as we move forward. Um, and then I believe our last slide is the financial summary that we have. Um, if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer any of those other questions we may have. Thank you, Scott. Council, any additional questions for Mr. Boucher? Thank you very much. Thank you. Quick. Yeah, very. We could talk a lot about this. Yeah. It's been a while since anybody asked me to sprint. So. Yeah. <laughs> More of a shot putter than a <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. I'm Frank McRae with the Energy Resource Department. Uh, John Petroff has joined me to the right and got some other members of the uh, management team. Uh, before I dig into the presentation, I would like to highlight that April is safe digging month, and so we can all help to protect our underground infrastructure by calling 811 before you dig. We also have some more information on our website, so you can click on the 811 tab. Um, that damage prevention program is one example of the role that utilities play in public safety. So um, I know we get a lot of uh, discussion and conversation and focus on fire and, and police departments having a role in uh, public safety, but the utilities do as well, and that's one example. Um, the matrix on slide 37 shows a, a real close correlation between what we do, our priorities in energy resources being the, the way we uh, safely and reliably and economically provide services to our customers. Those closely correlate to the council's strategic priorities as well. So slide 38 is some of our notable accomplishments in fiscal year 17-18. Um, appreciate everybody's contribution to help us celebrate our 100 year anniversary, but those awards were also pretty special to us as well. They're a testament to uh, the way our peers view how well we provide services to our customers. Their criteria involve safety, reliability, how we develop our workforce, uh, how we maintain our systems, the integrity of our systems, et cetera. So, um, slide 39 goes to our performance metrics that we are using. Um, and again, these re relate to the safety and reliability and efficiency or in this instance, uh, we're using affordability as, as, a, as a surrogate for efficiency, and you can see those. I won't go into any details on the targets, but if there's any um, issue with uh, where we've not met our targets, I'd be happy to elaborate on those. Um, let's see. I would like to mention on that slide that um, our affordability, we, we use SRP as a benchmark for how we compare on our residential customer uh, and their bills, and we compare very favorably. Uh, all quartiles of our customers are substantively below SRP's comparable services, so I want to make, emphasize that. So slide 40, um, as well as slide 42, are graphs that uh, show our revenue history, and the, the two distinct sources of revenues are uh, energy cost supply adjustment factor, and then our our other revenues, including non-rate revenues. 
And this was a particular point of discussion that Council Member Freeman and I had in our Audit and Finance Committee about we're seeing decreases in natural gas costs, and so are those being reflected in our customers' bills? And as you can see in graphs for our slides 40 and 42, um, our total revenues, which is a pretty good reflection of what our costs are, you can see those historically going down. On the electric side, it's about a 1% per year, on average, uh, decrease since the 0405 time frame. And what's contributed to that is we've had our, our energy supply costs, which are heavily influenced by natural gas plus. They've been going down while some of our other cost components, the rate revenues have gone up. Um, you will see one spike there up to the $36 million. That was a unique uh, accounting adjustment. We had funded some capital projects uh, dealing with the light rail project where we're putting in infrastructure in advance of, uh, but in, in, in concert with the light rail project. Uh, those costs came in lower than what we had funded, so those monies came back to the electric utility and they chose to account for those as a revenue. And so that's why you see that spike. That's not a reflection of an increase in cost. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, performance measures on the gas side. Again, we've had a couple of anomalies where we um, haven't met our performance metrics. I can go into explaining those events if you'd like. Um, on the, the gas side, we're competitive. <coughs> Excuse me, we're competitive with Southwest Gas, but the way they manage their gas supply adjustment factor mechanism will sometimes cause their rates and bills to come lower than ours, and that's the state where we're at right now. So. Okay. Um, again, the same type of information on slide 42 with gas as we just talked about with electric. Um, the the um, natural gas supply cost going down is a little bit more pronounced on the gas side than it is on the uh, electric side, but we've also had a little bit higher increases in gas rates over the last couple of years. But you can see there's a, a trend going down uh, in the last uh, 10 or so years, and um, that's about point, two tenths of 1% of a decrease per year overall. Um, our challenges that we face are pretty, pretty much the same as most of the utilities within the city or, or in the energy utility industry. We do have a kind of a unique situation compared to some utilities across the country. We have a very heavy mix of residential customers. We don't have a lot of commercial industrial customers. And we also live in a desert climate where the, the weather swings can have a significant influence on our revenues, especially as we've tried to recover a large part of our fixed costs through consumption-based charges. So um, our revenue rate proposals have kind of reflected trying to start recovering more and more of our fixed costs through those fixed charges on our bills. Um, for the proposed 18-19 budget, it's really a pretty, pretty closely reflected of what we've been doing in uh, fiscal year 17-18. Um, we are facing some, some challenges. Um, we, we use a lot of bond funding for our capital program, and so um, we're having to stretch the authorizations that we had voters approve in uh, 2014. Uh, to a couple more years than we would otherwise plan. Fortunately, some of um, our ability to do that is because we've, we've managed our costs and our projects very well. Um, downtown revitalization, while it certainly has a, a lot of potential positive attributes, uh, when it comes to the electric utility and being able to co accommodate new customers with new types of equipment may cause us to incur quite a bit of additional cost to reconfigure our electric system um, convert overhead to underground, um, and increase the size of transformers, et cetera. So um, we're prepared to do that, but um, depending on how fast and uh, how sudden it happens, could cause us some financial challenges where we have to restructure how we do things. We may, we may deplete our bond authorization sooner than we otherwise would. Um, the next couple of slides show our uh, <coughs> financial trends with the total sources and uses of funds. Um, there's nothing really unique there except for in 13-14 uh, you see our uses uh, significantly above our total sources. Um, that's where we took some money and uh, applied it on a cash basis rather than funding those capital investments with bonds. We took some money out of uh, the fund balance and used that to fund some infrastructure that we put in place 
uh, commensurate with the construction of the light rail through Central Mesa. So you can see after that, that expenditure uh, and setting aside those funds, it, it came back to a normal relationship between uses and sources. Um, the financial summary uh, in the next slide, um, there's nothing really unique or inordinate about that. Um, our operating expenditures are staying fairly steady. Um, our ECAF expenditures and our ECAF revenues, there's typically tries to be a dollar for dollar offset there. Um, where there is an over recovery, it's flowed through into the next year. So the dollar for dollar may not happen immediately. It may happen over time, but it does happen. Um, the natural gas five-year utility trend there, again, there's, there's nothing too unique there uh, to talk about, nothing too unordinary. And again, the, the gas utility financial summary. So with that, um, I think I've spent about 10 seconds <coughs> per slide thereabouts, so uh, I think that qualifies as a sprint. Thank you, Frank. Mr. Uh, Freeman. Congratulations on your safety record for both of them. I, I saw that. That's really good work, keeping your employees safe. Yes, sir. Thank you, Council. Any additional questions or comments? Appreciate it. Uh, does that come? No, we have. I'm sorry. Now, Candace. Thank you. Candace is going to come. <coughs> thank you, Candace. Uh, Mayor and Council, um, so that we want to make sure that we each department was able to come up and talk to you about their opportunities and their challenges and what's going on in their department, and then we kind of roll it all together for you. So just as uh, we bring this all together, we start looking at rates and adjustments to rates that we look on, at on an annual basis. Some of the things we do want to talk about is when we're talking about them here, we're talking about um, residential, usually we're always talking about residential, but it's also commercial on some of those cases as well. And we simplify it very much. So when we say a 3.5% rate increase, that's kind of a simplified version. There's actually a lot of um, intricacies about how that gets rolled out and developed. There was a question or a comment, I think, earlier about our water and residential and tiers, and that tiers still continue. Um, those. So there, there's uh, four different tiers in our water residential rates. And so whenever we're looking at this and we're looking at impacts, we're looking at the impact to our median home owner that we use on the homeowner comparison. Um, and so those are always for that. For those who have excess water usage, they would have a larger impact because they're using um, more water than the average user. Um, so how things are implemented does make a difference. When we pull all these together, and again, um, we're going to go over what the recommended adjustments are as well as some options. Again, um, attachment three has all of the detail on what the staff recommendation options were. Uh, the revenue impact is listed here on this slide by uh, category or by program. Um, that was the impact of the staff recommended adjustments. When we look at how that impacts our average residential customer, again, this is what was on that um, uh, comparison that was mentioned earlier when we compared ourselves to other municipalities around the, city, around the valley. Um, this is the monthly impact and the annual impact of what was recommended by staff to Audit Finance and Enterprise Committee. This slide here um, has the staff recommendations that was made to Audit Finance and Enterprise Committee. And so as you look through here and how to read this, um, going across, you can see we've really kind of brought it down to just the total sources and total uses. So that really um, goes back to all those slides that you saw. You saw one from each program where they showed you total sources and total uses, those financial statements. And so these really brings it down to say, what does the fund as a whole do um, for this? And again, in the enterprise fund, we have the utilities as well as the non-utility areas like our convention center and so forth. And those are also in attachment three. Candace, does this slide reflect the staff uh, recommendation, the, 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 the previous sl slide? This is the original. This yeah. is the original, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. so, so the, the slide previous to this that showed the monthly and annual impact related on to consumers, this. that's the, the chart that we're looking at right now? Correct. Okay, thank Correct. you. Correct. So all of this goes together, and then we will walk through the scenarios that we were asked to prepare from the Audit Finance and Enterprise Committee. So to kind of give you an overview first, though, of what the um, impact was of the original recommendation to the committee, this would be the financial sheet that would go along with that. So when we call it scenario A, that is the original recommendation to the committee. And the way to read this is kind of the rates are listed below in the green areas. And so you can see the original recommendation was a 3.5% increase on water, 4% wastewater, 35 on solid waste residential, and a 25 on solid waste commercial. 
So that was the, um, I'm sorry, that was, excuse me, that was what we implemented last year. And then if you go to 1819, you can see what was recommended for this year. It was basically the same for water, wastewater, and solid waste with um, uh, the commercial side of solid waste only at 2% for this year. So the 1819 column was the original recommendation to the committee. Now the way that you read this, we kind of mentioned earlier that we look at the enterprise fund as a whole and we manage as a whole and we're looking at that reserve balance to be no lower than 8% over the forecast period. That is the line that's in the middle where it says ending reserve balance percent. And you can see for planning purposes and for budgeting purposes, we like to stay at the 10%. And so that's why you'll see the lowest year up there is at that 10.4% out in 23-24. Okay. And so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about reserve balances. That's just a little over one month. Correct. One And then the second thing that we look at, so there's two things that go with our policy on how we try to, uh, re when we do uh, rate reviews. One is the reserve balance through the forecast period. The second one is to smooth the rates, as we mentioned earlier, that there aren't any rate spikes, high or low. There isn't a large variance um, over the next few years. And so you'll see for recommendations, that's why you'll see, um, for example, on the water, 3.5. That would be the anticipated 3.5 over the next few years so that we can maintain <coughs> the 10.4. You do see that the reserve balance is reducing. Um, again, though, that means is our, our uses are greater than our sources each year, um, but we're slowly building up the revenues so that we can accommodate the uses when we get out to 23, 24. So that's the philosophy behind where, um, how we look at the rates and how we um, do our rate recommendation for adjustments. Um, that is scenario A. We're going to call that scenario A today, which is the original recommendation. When we went to Audit Finance Enterprise Committee, they did ask us to run a, a separate scenario, and really two. Asked us the, the feedback we got was to one run scenario, which was if what happened if we reduced the rates one percent from where we are today, so a reduction of one percent across the board, and then the other feedback that we got received was um, options. And so we have two options for you here today to discuss. One is scenario B, that is reducing the rates across the board, 1%. You'll notice that we did not change solid waste commercial. Uh, we only changed the others. Solid waste commercial does have to make sure that we are staying within market so that we're not accused of using our residential services to offset our commercial because we compete in the commercial market. And so we didn't uh, do any adjustments to those. So we did adjust the other ones. So what you see as an impact to that, again, the other thing that we changed is our original recommendation kept our fund balances at 10% or above. Um, the financial policies do allow for a minimum of 8%. So we put in, we changed it to 8%, so that would kind of release some of the pressure in the later years just to see what the minimum rate adjustments we would need to maintain that. Mm -hmm. If we reduce the utility rates in 1819 by 1% of where they sit today, um, our estimates for the next four years would be uh, water rate adjustments would be needed at about 5.25% per year, wastewater at 575, solid waste residential at 525. Um, so that's where you see the changes. Also below in the light green would be the electric and gas, uh, where we did, we did kind of cross the board on those as well. So what this does show you is the impact of the adjustments to rates that we do today and how those impact the years that follow. Um, when we're trying to do a target year of, in this case, we would be at our 8% minimum reserve balance forecasted for 22-23, so uh, four years out. Candace, all, all of these forecasts uh, with the asterisk, I, I note that they all assume an economic downturn in 2020. In, in can 2021. You, can you remind us what, uh, how much of a downturn we're anticipating or planning for? On this one, so for on the um, general governmental side in 2021, we were estimating about a $9 million impact on the general governmental side. Um, on the utility side, it's not as great of an impact only because they are utilities that people need on a daily basis. And so it's really the, your discretionary use that you would see. Um, it's a slight, I don't have the number offhand, I apologize. Um, but it does occur in, in 2021, again, So we did about a, a three, three to four percent in the general governmental. We reduced that a little bit because of the necessity of the utilities. So it was about a one and a half percent, but it came out to about uh, 
it's four, five million dollars, close to the same as that, but because of the uh, percentage rate, it's, um, it's still significant because of the, the amount of the enterprise fund. Thank you. And that is included in all of these. So everything stays um, consistent between the scenarios. The only difference is what our target was for the reserve balances and then the, any adjustments to 1718. And then what we did is smooth, smooth the rest of the years, what would those years look like if, if that action was taken. So this is uh, what we're calling scenario B, which was the request from the committee to do that. Um, to bring back, we were also asked for different options. And so option C would be <clears throat> a variation, if you will, on the original recommendation from staff. And so that really just has, again, lowering our lowest reserve balance to the 8%, making sure that we stay above 8% versus the 10% in the original scenario. And then looking at what, how low we could um, kind of go in 1819 and still maintain some of the rates at, you know, not above a uh, four and a half percent or five percent. So it was kind of a kind of in the middle there. And so in this particular scenario in 1819, if adjustments were made to the rates in water at a two percent, two and a half percent for wastewater, and then the two percent for solid waste residential, um, you would see that the impact over the next four years would be in that probably 3.85, you know, so 3.9, 4.4 between the uh, water, wastewater, and solid waste over those particular years. So it does relieve some of the uh, adjustment in 1819, but it does, again, increase what we would project to be needed in 1920 through 22, 23. Those are the three scenarios that we have that we were asked to bring back um, for this particular meeting, and so we would open it up to questions or discussion and direction. Mr. Glover. Well, I know at Auden Finance, it wasn't just these three scenarios. We actually asked you to look at what would a reduction 2% and 3%, which you sent out yesterday, and that every all the council received as well. And I, I support a reduction. Um, I would have to say at least a reduction by at least 2%, if not greater than that. Um, this is the scenario that was sent out yesterday that was requested just recently, and this is showing... Well, it was requested 2%. at the audit and finance meeting. I think my colleagues will back me up on that one, Candace. Okay. This is the scenario that was sent out to council yesterday, and it is um, here for discussion and, per and look at. If you were to reduce the current rates today overall at a negative 2%, going, going um, backwards in our rates from last year, you would see the impact that we would project going forward would be above 6% on wastewater and about 5.8 on water and um, the other, the solid waste. Why would we decrease rates this year only to shift the burden of massive rate increases in future years? Well, I think what it really comes down to is what council's priorities are. You don't have to increase rates every year. That's what staff recommendation is, but council's the one who sets the priority. Well, sure, but I, by the charter, we have to mean an 8% reserve balance. Is that correct? Uh, our financial, adopted financial policies, Council's financial, financial policies call for us to stay above 8%. Is the one we've agreed to with our rating I still don't understand why we wouldn't smooth out rate increases. If our priority is to spend money, then it makes more sense to smooth out the rate of increases. Why would we wait to drop a 6% increase next year, but decrease rates by 2% this year. This doesn't have any logic to me. I think from my colleagues on the audit and finance committee, we wanted to see what we could do to help our low income residents, especially in Mesa that are in the service territory of all uh, water, gas, and electric, and see what we can do to help. And again, each year council can look and see what our demand is. We don't necessarily need to spend all that money. And again, it's council's priority to where we want to have that percentage. We're the ones who adopt the policy. I haven't seen anything about how the ASU building impacts these rates. So, Mayor and Council, it's built into right. um, the forecast here. Um, and I think that was going to be, I mean, we can talk about it now. It was, um, and that Probably is actually the economic investment. Correct. And um, uh, Mayor and Councilmember Whitaker, in attachment three is the detail. So then this is the summed up of the, of the full enterprise fund. But in attachment three on each one of the um, uh, 
programs themselves, the utilities, you can see the transfers out section. And there are two different transfers out. One is the transfer out to the general fund, and the other one is a transfer out to the economic investment fund. So Correct. Even going back to the very beginning original rate proposal that was presented to the audit and finance, uh, we had built in uh, $6 million a year placeholder uh, for all the improvements related to ASU. And so that's, uh, we were able to um, and provide that in a, to the financial forecast at the three and a half percent, which is consistent with what at, we had predicted or forecast from the prior year. So without impacting future rates that had been previously, that were previously known uh, by the council, we were able to absorb the six million through additional growth in the system, as well as some um, debt, fin debt financing um, savings that we were able to achieve. So we used, we took those components as well as what we anticipate the cost um, that would be needed for the capital improvements for ASU, and we included those in all the scenarios from the very beginning. So it's already been built in from the beginning. So how much of the utility rate increases are due to the fact that we're building an ASU building? So there's, as I said, there's six million dollars a year that's included in all the forecasts, including the forecast that holds the rates the same that we had um, shown council from prior years. Um, so. If you look at it from the prior year forecast going forward, the $6 million did not um, increase the rates uh, because we had, um, we were able to have savings from the debt finance or managing debt as well as growth, additional growth in the system. Now, if the question is, what does $6 million do to the overall system? This is a $400 million in revenues coming into the system. So $6 million of additional expenses, less than 2% of the total uh, revenues that are coming into the system. So at what rate would the utilities be decreased if we didn't build the ASU building? So six, you said 6 million, I can't remember what the number you guys used for um, what 1% was worth in revenues is about what? About three and a half million. Three and a half. So less than 2%. Or, or well, I, I think le less than 2% of the revenues is what we're talking about. Well, and 2% uh, no. rate. And, yeah. If you, the question is, if you took the 6 million out, um, you know, where, w what would happen? Um, frankly, most of it would probably, as we have shown in the, the first scenario, would just stay in the fund balance. Um, but overall, I mean, if you were to find, if you had $6 million, it's equivalent to what it costs the rate is of about less than 2%. Am I saying that right, Brian? It's yes. more or less. But again, council will say, this is, we can either look at it as an expense or an investment. That's how we, we've looked at it. Um, it's hard to look at the utilities. It's difficult. We know the rates are, um, have impact across the city, um, a variety of individuals, but it is also the one generator we have. And I think, frankly, the outcome, because we were able to expand our utility systems across the city, you are seeing lowered tax, property tax rates because we have higher amount of new value that's coming into the city. A lot of that is being driven by the fact that we have the infrastructure to support a lot of the industry and manufacturing, as well as new subdivisions that are coming online. Um, so that generates additional, sell, both property, property rate decrease that will be experienced because the values and new construction is significant. And with new construction and new activity, obviously we've seen significant increases in sales tax. So this is the one area where we have the ability to create the catalyst to the investment in the city to help generate income that's maybe not shown up here in utility rates, but it certainly, I think, is reflective in new growth um, and additional growth both in the property tax values as well as the sales tax. And so it's been the history of Mesa going back, and I think we talk about the Economic Investment Fund going back to 2010, where we've used this fund as the way to do investments in the city. Um, but certainly, um, it's an impact. It has, I mean, it's just like any expense in here, it's $6 million. And if you, what would a $6 million do? We, would, we tried to be very careful to manage it so it didn't impact the rates that had previously been identified, so it wasn't creating any additional pressure from what had already been identified in this utility from prior years. 
And I think we were able to do that. And again, a lot of that is both growth as well as savings in our debt, uh, debt payments. You believe it's sustainable to compound annually utility rates at 3.5% in perpetuity? I think it's difficult, but um, as you saw, um, our costs from SRP are going up 5% a year for water. Um, chemical costs are going up. Um, to expand our system, and what's driving this, the biggest number that's driving here is not $6 million in investment in the Economic Incentive Fund. You, the, the largest increases are um, in debt service, um, and that's, you were bringing on these large plants. We're now having to, we're seeing that principal and interest payment um, going on. This is just the slide that we had just to show you what the recommendation was for last year. Is there a utility rate adjustment scenario that does not include the ASU building? No, all factors were, hold, were held constant in all of these scenarios. The only things that we changed in the scenarios was changing the reserve balance target and then the 17 or the 18, 19 adjustments to the rates so that we held everything else constant. So how am I supposed to see the impact of the ASU building if there's no utility rate adjustment scenarios that don't include the ASU building? Well, I guess we'd like, maybe if the council, I mean, we presumed because the direction from the council was to build ASU, just, we, just like it is to go build a plant, we include it in this scenario. Does the ASU building increase utility rates? From our prior year um, rates that we have shown, no, it does not. Assuming that you're going to keep increasing rates at 3.5%. As we have prior to the issue discussion, those were already established rate increases. So it doesn't change the scenario from prior to discussion about ASU. It doesn't change the rate increases that had previously been shown and had been discussed. The rate increases that you see, the original rate increases, the 3.5%, frankly, came out of our discussion. We talked about this is that if we were going to take on $580 million of capital improvements throughout the system, this was going to be the impact, along with other increases in water and chemicals, that was going to be the impact to the system overall. And so that scenario has been consistent. We tried to be very consistent with holding that from the very beginning. So the idea that how did you, you know, how do we take on ASU? And we've said we we're going to absorb that into the existing rate plan, increased plan, because we've seen savings in debt and we've seen additional growth uh, higher than we expected. It's very similar to the same reason we were able to absorb uh, Ben U and Mesa Center for Higher Education. We took the savings from debt financing and we paid for a total of 16, what are my number, 10, 12 and six or something like that? Yes. Or? $16 million worth of improvements to those two facilities for higher education. And we absorb that inside of the enterprise fund. What, now, I think what we've shown here is um, there is some capacity um, to, um, you know, a, again, every year we're going to evaluate this. And I think Councilman Glover's right. Every year we have the opportunity to evaluate this. We're showing you the long-term forecast because we want and utilities, because of the long lead time on capital projects and other items, we need to show you that five-year perspective. Um, but I do think there is an opportunity, um, if we want to show, if we could show the, just the 2%, that the rate increase that we were looking for, the 3.5%, probably could be adjusted downward. We could, we could you know, still come within our target. We ended up that even at the 3.5%, we saw that we ended up at over 10%. So we can reduce that down for planning purposes. For now, we could reduce the uh, rate increase from 3.5% to 2%. And then next year, we'll take another look at, you know, no one's saying there's, there's not a mandate to do the 3.8 next year. We'll look at it again. We'll see how growth is taking place. We'll continue to look for opportunities for uh, reducing costs in our, and remember, this is a fixed asset uh, Operation. So a lot of these costs are big assets, are big chunky uh, um, expenses, but we can continue to look at ways to try to bring that 3.8, 4.35. It'd be nice to get all those um, closer to three or under three ne even next year. But right now, for planning purposes, what we know, we could reduce the three and a half um, down to two when you see the other numbers there and reduce the increase. And again, that still allows us to deliver 
on the uh, building out the economic incentive fund, investment fund. Mr. Thompson. And I think to Jeremy's point, too, on going back to the rate adjustments, you know, this, if we're going to hit uh, or if we're predicting in 2021 um, a blip in the economy, the last thing I think we want to do is really hit people with a 5.8% increase. And so I'm, I'm more favorable to the smoothing um, of the rates uh, at the, you know, as in scenario C or something of that magnitude, uh, a, a huge jump and in, in a rate increase uh, when people are probably going to be, hopefully we won't have a long-term recession like we did. Maybe it'll just be a, a blip on the map. Um, but to me, that's the wrong time to really be hitting people on the, on the utility rates. And my assumption with the IGA uh, was that we would pay for ASU if it didn't increase rates um, or the sales tax. So to make the assumption that we wouldn't do a utility rate adjustment scenario without ASU, it's not a fair comparison to me because you have to bake those into those rates. And further, I don't know why we would decrease the rates this year only to substantially increase the rates in future years. I mean, there's no logic behind that other than to say, look, we just built ASU. We reduce the utility rates, and there's no new sales tax. Other than that being uh, some form of a PR, I don't know what else the point is in decreasing rates this year, only to shift that burden to next year and all the other years. Um, you know, I, I, I think we're asking the wrong question, frankly. I think that the question we ought to be asking is if we did no economic development in our downtown, if we didn't do anything to try to increase and promote uh, our utility system, what is the long-term economic impact on ratepayers in that scenario? Uh, and so I think uh, we have a, an interesting uh, business model in the city of Mesa. We, are, uh, we don't have a primary property tax because our city fathers 70 years ago said we're going to finance city government on the back of utility revenues. So that, those are the cards that were dealt and that's how we have to play. Um, and I think, again, looking at the scenarios that have been presented to us, the, the, uh, the income that comes from our utilities right now, $370 million. In the next few years, that'll increase to $450 million. The idea of, of, of having an economic development fund that siphons off five to six to seven million dollars from that uh, is so statistically irrelevant that it does not provoke a utility increase a rate increase. But rather, like I say, I think the more significant impact would be not doing any economic development to promote and encourage additional economic act activity and additional utility customers in our downtown. If we're concerned about put, keeping pressure off of rate payers, we need to grow the system so that we have more customers that are paying more into the system. Um, we have this, this tension uh, as a result of the, 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 the system that we have where we rely on utility rates where uh, we have this, this tale of two cities, an aging uh, system in, in a large part of our town that has breaks and requires a lot of maintenance. On the other hand, a brand new, uh, fast growing, significant demands for growth in another, in another part of our city. So we have a, a unique set of challenges. Uh, we also have the voters that have approved in 2014 a half a billion dollars in bonds for utilities telling us that they want us to meet the demands of having both an aging and a growing community. And so that's the mandate that we have from our voters is to not shut things down and just uh, not encourage growth or, or, or respond to the demands. Uh, so I think that and unless we do dramatically change our system by shifting to a, a um, primary property tax system, which I don't think the voters will approve, uh, we have to, I think, build our utility base, uh, and that's how we're going to lessen the uh, the rate uh, uh, pressure on our on our uh, customers. Now, on, so that on, on the other side, I acknowledge that water is high, it costs more than we would like it to in our city, and so I think we need to be sensitive to that and, and increase rates only when we absolutely have to. Uh, I think we also ought to look at um, bolstering our utility assistance fund. Uh, for the low-income folks in our, in our city that this would present a particular hardship for. Uh, I think we ought to revisit uh, the ABC fund and how we allocate those funds. To me, it makes sense to tie that. When I'm, if I'm feeling philanthropic when I'm paying my 
my uh, city utility bill and I want to throw in a few extra dollars to help those who might be at risk of having their utility shut off, I think that's the, the appropriate time to, to address that. So I would encourage us to look at that and to bolster that. Uh, but I do agree that uh, we need to, if we are to increase rates, we have to do it in a way that's not going to promote a dramatic sp a spike a year or two from now. Uh, so for those reasons, I, I favor scenario C that's been presented to us. It, uh, times are good right now, and I think we ought to reflect that. We ought uh, to, to err on the side of being optimistic and hoping that an economic downturn doesn't come, but if it does, that we will respond at the appropriate time. But given that things are good right now, I think we probably can be more modest in the, the rate increases that have been proposed over the past few years and, and, and by staff initially. So. Uh, my thinking right now would be to endorse scenario C. Uh, to clarify, isn't A the scenario that smooths it out, not scenario C? If you're saying times are good, scenario C is the smallest increase in this fiscal year and it shifts the burden to future years. Correct. Times are so good, wouldn't you want to absorb the cost increase in the good years? No, I think because, because things are good now, I think we don't have to increase rates as dramatically as staff has initially suggested, so that's why I'd, in, I'd endorse scenario C. Now, scenario, I think if things continue to be good, uh, then we can have the same conversation next year. And if our fund balance is still in the 20s, uh, and we, can, uh, we don't think that we need to have an, a more aggressive rate increase, then I th this is a conversation that we're going to have every year. Yeah. Uh, but I think like, like right now, I, I'm, I'm willing to err on the side of optimism and to put off a, a more significant rate increase. I fail to see the reason why we wouldn't smooth out the rate increase if we know in five years that our fund balance is going to drop to 8%. Well, the, we don't know that. We're anticipating that, and part of that is based on an anticipation that there's going to be a, a downturn in the economy in 2021. So if we knew exactly what the economy was going to be like for the next several years, you know, we'd, we'd be unique. Uh, I don't, we can estimate it. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, was, I was, the question was being asked. Um, we don't have to make that decision. It would help, obviously, yeah. if we get that direction. Generally, we can head in that direction. Um, so, so that we anticipate as we go uh, forward in the, um, towards the, um, when's the hearing on this? May? The hearing is, the, the public hearing is on May 21st. Yeah. Um, then the, the direction that we would need would be the time to prep for any an introduction of the ordinance. So yeah. it can we can introduce the ordinance before the public hearing, we can introduce it at the time of the public hearing or after. The deadline on introducing the ordinance just affects the effective date, okay. but the public hearing itself would still be held on uh, May 21st regardless. But it's also good to get this information out mm -hmm. as, as soon as yeah. possible. And to the mayor's point, uh, council, we would like to come back to you and present um, some ideas on how we could increase the funds that we have available to assist those um, who may be mm -hmm. in, impacted at the lowest levels. And, um, and, and Mayor mentioned something about the ABC funds. The ABC funds today are allocated as part of the human services yeah. funding process. Um, but if council desired, we could make maybe a bigger portion of that or some portion mm -hmm. of that more directly related to the utility assistance mm -hmm. and frankly, there is some confusion mm -hmm. out there because I think some, I think SRP, that's how they use their, mm -hmm. I don't know what their fund is called, but that contribution. Yeah. And so people sometimes are confused about our ABC mm -hmm. fund and what it goes towards. And we've tried to do better at explaining that goes to, um, I mean, it goes to great purposes, nonprofits, but the question is, would you rather maybe set aside more of that to go towards uh, assisting with um, utilities? And we, by the way, use many of those nonprofits to assist us mm -hmm. in doing the um, eligibility yeah. determination, plus they help do other wraparound services. So. Hi, uh, Mr. Luna. Thank you. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm supportive of a scenario C, and I agree that council does set priorities in terms of what we, how we move forward. So I would advocate for that. But we might want to work with Mesa Canton because yes, that's really that's what they we do is they yeah. provide utilities assistance. And, yeah. and I also believe that we need to reinvest in our community and so I'm certainly supportive of the, the Economic Development Fund for reinvestment, so I'm going to be supporting um, Proposal C. Mr. Thompson. I agree with Jeremy. I, I'm more in support of Scenario A. I think it gives the long-term uh, stability and the long-term confidence, I guess, in the consumer on the, you know, on the residential and commercial side. 
of knowing what your rates are going to be into the future, um, which I think is important, especially if you're a business looking to, to move into a, into a city, you want to know with confidence what your rates are going to be into the future. Um, and it's, it's a, to me, it's a more smooth, um, it's a more smooth scenario, uh, so much more than, than dropping the rates and then drastically raising the rates. I support uh, scenario A, but also um, I just want to understand on the, on the ABC funds, portion of that's being used for the K-12, right? Because it's being shifted to the human services and then from human services. Kevin, pre-K. I think, why well, I ABC funds? Or I mean pre-K, I'm sorry, pre-K. Well, you can answer that. Thompson. Last year, $60,000 of the ABC funds were allocated to the Mesa K Ready program. This year, the recommendation is that CDBG dollars be used. So it is not being included in the recommendations um, this year. Okay. And I want to say ABC collects a little over 100000 Am I close? 110, I thought. 110, something like that, right? Yeah. But I think that's combined with the general funds allocation for human services and then that's how but again that was just one option as possibly um i think we said we have right now fifty thousand dollars yeah we did institute um a couple i think it's been two years now at least yeah. um, that we at least that we instituted fifty thousand dollars was set aside for utility assistance um, specifically um, we don't administer it but we administer it through this the nonprofits, and then the 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 folks are receiving uh, credit vouchers and that's how they actually pay their bill um, is to a, a credit back to us. And so we do have that set up at this point. But the, so the option is we could increase we could, we that could amount. We could expand that. Um, and maybe use some of those ABC funds to do that. That was my thought. And I know this is a competitive process. It goes through a lot of community vetting and staff recommendations. So, you know, we're not going to decide that now. That'll be a lot of folks will weigh in on that. But I, I would, speaking for myself, I would, I, like I said, I think it would be clarity in the minds of, of those who are contributing to ABC if they knew that when they were making this donation as part of their utility payment, I think they do link that to helping folks with utilities. So I, I think if we put out an RFP to Mesa Can or whoever is administering this program and said we would consider increasing the allocation for helping low-income folks with their utility bills, uh, I, I think I would probably be supportive of that next year when we're making those allocations. Uh, Mayor, just so you know, today we just kind of part of our process. We just we've already set aside the fifty thousand for Mesa Can, and it's not I say Mesa Can, but I think the Salvation Army participates, New Leaf participates. I don't remember all, but it's a coalition of groups that um, uh, participate. I have a question. Uh, this year we voted to amortize the PSPRS debt from twenty years to twenty-five years, right? And that cost the city. What? Oh, you're right. Oh, I'm sorry. And that cost the city how much money in added interest payments? What's, it saved us in the current year how much? It, it saved us in the current year $4 million in, in a PSPRS scheduled contributions. We have, I would go back and calculate what that means in the long term. Yeah, so what does that mean in the long term, though? I mean, like, if I go and take my car payment and I turn it from a five-year car payment into a 10-year car payment, I'm right. still accumulating a significant amount of interest in shifting that debt further down the road, right? So my question is, if shifting our PSP, PSPRS burden from 20 to 25 years cost us somewhere in the realm of half a billion dollars, Kenny, did you know that number off the top it's, of your head? Um, I apologize. I, I, again, I thought yeah, you knew it off the top. This is part of this topic. Yeah, right. we might be a little Mayor, off the agenda. Well, I'm, just trying to, I'm just trying to understand. If we're doing so well financially this year that we're going to lower the utility rates, then why am I shifting the burden of my public safety retirement system and, and keep amortizing debt further and further out? So it's two different funds, right? It's going to impact two. There's no, none of that affects any of this. It absolutely does. It comes out of the general fund, but eventually the money has to be transferred in from the enterprise, right? I mean, that it does the general not necessarily. I mean, the general fund that um, this covers a hundred million dollars of public safety, but that's not the full amount of public safety. I mean, that to say that this is somehow directly related to PSPRS is a. I mean, it's it's an association only by name, but there, I don't know that we would say we don't look at this number and say the transfer out of the. Enterprise fund and the general fund has anything to do with the PSPRS. We didn't uh, increase this transfer when we had a spike in the PSPRS fund by $10 million. We didn't 
generate, we didn't ask for more money out of the enterprise fund to cover that cost. How much did the amortization from the PSPS fund from 20 to 25 years cost us an additional interest payment? We, um, the half a billion dollars going from the 20 to 30 years, um, and so we didn't look at the, the, the 20 to 25 years, but that's over time, and that's in those dollars. So, you know, we can, we can talk about this offline, but a, a dollar 30 years from now is a lot uh, less valuable than a dollar today. So if you present value that amount, it'll be the same as it is today, a 20-year versus a 30-year. That's getting kind of geeked out in, in finance, but, uh, but yeah, you're right, half a, half a billion dollars, or um, yeah. But we're taking that savings. What are we doing with the savings? Yeah, the savings in debt service this year is we're putting, you know. Not debt service, uh, but PS per It's not debt service. Yeah. The so, payments that we would have had to make yeah. the PS per S, our policy, again, was not, is to hold it so that we can avoid the spikes that we've seen in PS per S in the, in the future. And so yeah. we're using that as a hedge against those increases. Yeah, we had, a, we, we originally planned for the 20 years, and so we went to the 25 years. We saved that $4 million, but then we also set up a $4 million reserve fund uh, for the PS per S spikes that we'll see. In the so the $4 million that's being saved this year in PS per S is not in any way included in this is a totally separate fund. It's right. not Correct. included in no. any of our There's operating no expenses. Well, not in this, not in these funds. It's in the general fund. But they commingle, right? No. no. There's there See? this. So this particular fund, on this particular scenario, we have a transfer that goes from the enterprise fund into the general fund. The gen, the transfer was not adjusted when the PSPRS went up. Neither was it adjusted when we did the change from the 20 year to the 25 years. So we have not changed the transfer going from the enterprise fund to the general fund. Well, there's has been not no changed cause and effect because of PSPRS. No, no cause and effect out of this transfer. No, I'm not. I mean it's a big number, you know, but it's but it's um, 109, 108 million dollars. But we've never adjusted the transfer to cover PSPRS expenses. Instead, we've reduced um, salary, incre uh, salary increases for employees and we've reduced the number of positions we've added. That's what we've had to do in the general fund to cover those costs. Mayor, Mr. Freeman. Uh, just shorten the conversation here. I, I support scenario C, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, also, I uh, support scenario C, uh, I think, uh, as, Colleagues mentioned uh, we can revisit next yes. year as well, and, every, and every year, every possibly year. Uh, from that 3.85, maybe plan that out to 3.5. You know, it depends on you know what happens next year as well. So right, so I think to lessen the burden this year uh, and have a discussion next year to to see what the five-year plan uh, I think makes sense. Uh, senior OC, so I support that. I think the big takeaway from this meeting is next year we schedule four hours for this yeah. meeting <laughs> rather than three we hours. We will do that. Okay. Okay, so that's not an action item, but I think staff needed to it hear gives this us a general reaction. We're building okay. towards the, 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 the proposed budget. We can, ha we can include that in there. That'll be very helpful. Okay. Thank you. All Candace, right. do you have a, is your um, presentation that's, over? That's what I had regarding the utility, uh, the enterprise fund and utility rates in general. Um, there was some questions on the um, economic investment fund. There is a presentation that is in your backup. Um, I is there can, any other I can questions do the regarding that? Or you can just you review it and ask me questions if you have those um, so we can um, shorten the time here. But either way, I'm ready to do either one. The economic investment fund is attachment four, correct? It is. Um, there should be a presentation, and then the financial four. schedule that goes oh, with I'm it sorry. is attachment four, but there's a second presentation. It just gives a brief history of what, how it's been used and, oh, no, there was some, and yeah. the fact that we are, that is where we will be, we're proposing to fund the improvements for issue. So it is a very short presentation. I don't want to shortchange the, I, I, I think obviously there's a lot of interest in, in that fund, so I think we ought to have that presentation and that discussion, but I wonder if we could continue it for sure. another meeting. Absolutely. Mr. Thompson. Candace, can you um, put together the, the, um, what the average homeowner and the average commercial or um, uh, retail type facility would use rate wise for scenario A and scenario C, what that would look like? Um, so holding constant they at three point five. What their impact would be? What their what their annual impact would be on their utility rates? Because that's because that's almost a one percent increase from um, 
from this year to what it would be next year, from a 2% to a 3.85? I mean, that's almost no, no, 1%. Next, or right. from next year to the following year, right? Year two. You're talking about right. fiscal year uh, 1920. Right, yes. But, not, but the following year, so for this year, it'd be at 2, and a half, two percent versus 3.5%. Right. Next year, instead of being 3.5%, it'd be 3.85%. 3 3 right. so, so is that the difference you're looking for? So I'm looking for the difference between 2%. And 3.85 percent, because that's almost a one percent increase, right? Oh, to right, go from this change. year to next year. I see. Okay. So what what would the hit be on the typical residential? So you want to compare that to the three and a half percent, not the two percent. No, the 3.85, because if we're given direction to move towards do implementing a two percent increase or two percent, a decrease to two percent from 3.5 to two mm percent, -hmm. but then we turn around next year and hit, potentially hit our residents with a 3.85%, which would be almost a 1% increase, what does that average monthly bill look so, like? So, Councilman, just to be clear, that's why, um, well, let's compare years, right? So this year, proposal is 2%. Right. Next year, it's either 3.5% or 3.85%. 3.85. If we do 2%, so, so if we do 2% this year, then next year it'll be 3.85%. Right. On there. So Versus three and a half percent. Correct. So what is that almost one percent increase from eighteen nineteen to nineteen twenty? Page fifty two has. So what does that look like? Okay. Well, mm -hmm. well, let tell you what. We'll just run. Here's how much the increase would be this year, and here's how much it would be next year. For scenario A versus scenario C. How's that? And for, no. for so what I'm, so here's what I'm looking for. For year two. If I if I'm paying my bill today on a two percent increase or a two percent rate. So your all rate revenue, so your water rate is at 2%. So I'm paying 2% this year. Next year, I'm going to be paying 3.85%. I want to know how much of an increase that is going to look like on my bill. Okay. Because that's I'll, almost a 1% increase. But I, I would add on, so on Sarah A, it's 3.5, so it's really 0.35 yeah. of an increase that we you would see, folks would see that. Well, no, so. not necessarily, because if my rate today, if, if I'm paying 3.5% today and I'm paying 3.5% next year, I'm not seeing an increase. But if I'm paying 2% this year no, and 3.85% yeah, yeah. next year, then I'm seeing a, almost yeah. a 1%. Mayor, so Council 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 these, are, these are additional increases each year. So it's not the same increase next year. Next year is an additional 3.5%, an additional. Over the two. Yeah. yeah. Yes. That's the increase, not wow. the rate. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I apologize. I know it's hard. You get caught up in seeing the rate. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is just a reflection of an increase, okay. not the rate. The rate is a very complicated formula. It's the percentage increase in that in okay. those rates. Right. Okay. Okay. So. okay, Mr. Freeman. I swore I wasn't going to say anything, but uh, <laughs> page 52, it indicates the amount of rates the average homeowner would pay. I think it's an additional $70 per year if you add up all the annual for each utility and that would increase seventy dollars each year over the next subsequent years actually becomes more because it gets compounded on top okay. of those numbers so it would be more so we looked at smoothing that bringing it down yeah. uh, just to help customers get used to what we're going to be doing and every year we're going to try to keep those as low as possible has anybody ever looked at the long-term effect of compounding the utility rates at 3.5% yeah, every yeah, single year? Yeah, we tried very hard to not do it, yeah. But it's the compounding effect of the debt, too. It's the same thing. I mean, we get it, and it's difficult. And the challenge is, is putting off these capital projects as long as we can before not doing them becomes more expensive than, you know, doing them. Yeah, and, and to clarify, I'm not referring to the capital projects that are requirements, I'm referring to the discretionary income that we're using with the leftover money, right? That's the part that I have an issue with. Well, but I think the bulk of this goes to pay the capital projects. The, the discretionary part is a handful of millions. The, the capital yeah. is tens of millions. Yeah. So like, like it goes back to the original question that we've all been asking is, you know, the economic development fund, yes, that's five, six, seven million dollars a year of, of debt service, but that's not enough to to move the needle on rates. What moves the needle on rates is the fact that the voters in 2014 approved a half a billion dollars in bonds for utilities, and we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on facilities. That necessitates raising rates to pay those bonds off. 
Yeah, all I'm saying is historically, I think over the last 16 years, I ran the numbers, and I think that we've on average increased rates at about 4.7% on the utilities. Now we're projecting that we're going to increase them at 3.5%. At some point when you compound these numbers, people can't afford the bills anymore, right? That, that's, that we're very sensitive to that. But also, if you go back 16 years, the population and the users of our utility have expanded significantly. So it's not a real, you can't focus on the how it impacts one ratepayer per se, because the base continues to grow, the diversity of the economy, so that as that happens, we're spreading that cost out over a larger base. So it doesn't stay fixed. You can't, if you went to the same bill of someone 16 years ago, it's not compounded because we're able to grow the system and spread the cost. Again, one of the reasons we're able to absorb the six million is our base of customers, both on the industrial side and the com uh, residential side, has expanded significantly, and that helps to spread those costs out over more. Um, I'm saying bills. if you took your utility bill 20 years ago and you compounded that number at 4.7 percent, you get the average utility bill today, unless I've miscalculated no, you, some that's numbers. That's what I'm saying is you, you uh, well. Be it's the still that one utility bill is going up at 4.7% every single year. So same. Now we're projecting that the utility bill is going up at 3.5% every year, whether we project that. But historically, it suggests that our 3.5 projection is actually too low, right? I mean, if historically you've increased at 4.7. And my only point is that when we use discretionary funds to build things that aren't absolutely necessary to provide these utilities the infrastructure that they need to keep going, hence the ASU project that I'm opposed to, is that you eventually eat into the person's, the median income, and I'm not even talking about the low, the low income people are gonna see it first, but now I'm talking about the median right. income, the average income person. If you're gonna compound their utility bills at 3.5% every single year, eventually that's gonna be 50% of right, the- But we're not their, compounding the economic investment fund, and- I know we, you're not compounding the economic investment fund, but the economic investment fund is funded by the utility rate increases, which you are co compounding, mm -hmm. projected to compound at 3.5%. Mostly because of the growth in, in building the system. Okay. All I'm saying is when you have discretionary no. funds left over, you discretionarily spend them. But my point is we're spending money that we otherwise don't have because the, the social unrest that's gonna come from increasing utility rates at 3.5% <coughs> annually, compounded, is simply not sustainable. And I, and I don't know what the plan is. If we're gonna keep increasing these rates, that, you know, <laughs> we don't survive. Eventually, you eventually 50% of a person's income is gonna to go to paying their utility bills. 100% of their income is not a sustainable model. I think we've said all we can, you know, I disagree with everything you just said, uh, but why don't we continue this conversation to our next, uh, when we continue the, uh, the the discussion about the Economic Development Fund, because this is a discussion we ought to continue to have, but I think we're out of time today. So let's let's continue this and we'll, we'll discuss what it is that prompts utility rate increases, whether it's, well, we'll, we'll, we'll continue that conversation. Council, other questions regarding or comments on this item? Uh, the next item on our agenda is um, item two, acknowledge receipt of- Mary, before you go there, just, oh, so, just so you know, and we won't make a presentation, but included in your agenda, as we talked about during the council strategic process, we've identified the first key performance uh, indicators to oh, share sure. with you. So they're there, you, they're related to public safety. The good news is the public safety departments are gonna come before you, but we wanted to start showing you how that report would look like. And really the intention is to give that to you in advance. And then to, if you have questions um, when that item comes up, I think we decided every four weeks, six weeks or whatever, we'd bring you a different grouping of uh, performance measures. Then if you had questions, we could answer them here. Otherwise, these are always available on the website. They're not just being produced here, they're available. Um, but it was an opportunity to highlight those. So I just shared that they're there and that's all that needs to be said unless you had some specific questions. And again, again, we'll probably be covering most of those again when the public safety departments come before you. Thank you, I appreciate you doing that. I know I've, I've specifically asked for these things, so I apologize for glossing Fine. over them, and I'm, I'm sure we will spend a appropriate amount of time with them. Mr. Thompson. Chris, can we, get the, um, can we get the number of calls for service for each of the precincts um, for, well, I'd say precincts for police and then 
for stations for um, you'll, you'll, fire. We'll show you the stations next week, right? Yeah. Is that the presentation? Yeah, we're doing. Yeah, we'll okay. have you. We'll get fire for you first, and then we can get PD. Okay, perfect. Okay, so thank you again. I, 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 agenda item one C is those um, dashboard statistics. Yeah, it's just information only, yeah. Mayor. That's and thank you. Item two then is receipt of board minutes. Is there a motion to that effect? Thank you, Mr. Freeman, Mr. Thompson. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item three is here reports on meetings and conferences attended. Council, anything you'd like to share with us? If not, item four is scheduled for future meetings and general information, Mr. Brady. Just uh, again, reminder, we don't have a council meeting on Monday, but we do have another study session and we will continuing throughout the rest of the month on Thursday, April 12th. And I believe that is the day we're scheduled for fire. Is that correct? Oh, PD, sorry. Please, oh, I flipped, sorry, yeah. Council Thompson, the other way around. We'll do PD first and then fire. So, um, but those are the f next two departments that'll be coming on Thursday. Um, reminder, the Saturday, April 7th from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m is the Cyclo Mesa Festival event in downtown Mesa. So I encourage everybody to come down for that. And uh, we'll see you on next Thursday. Thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn this meeting? Thank you, Mr. Luna. All in favor, please say aye. 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 We are adjourned. <laughs>